Hello there boys and girls, welcome to the Strange and Deadly Show, brought to you by Gentleman's Grindhouse Records. On this show we discuss films on the Section 3 list related to the video nasties. Yes we do, we pair up our films every fortnight based on a theme. You can find out more information about all of our podcasts, and there are many, over at gentlemansgrindhouserecords.com. C-O-M. And subscribe on iTunes via any podcatcher you might be using. We'll give you that information again. And also tell you how you can get your feedback and comments over to us at the end of the show. So here we are, episode 19, one away from our 20th episode. My goodness, I never thought we'd quite get get get, get, what, get, 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 get here. My goodness, indeed. Well, it's been kind of a sad time for the world recently, really. The world's been mourning because of what happened in Paris. Uh, in France there and uh, well this is not the sort of show where we get political really or that we sort of dwell on very sad things Uh, in fact if anything we're here to sort of cheer everybody up but uh, certainly it's been a difficult time for everybody so here's here's what we're going to do for you we're going to try and make you laugh try and make you smile if we can be as enthusiastic as we possibly can be because we are very enthusiastic hosts Uh, my name of course is the egotist and I'm joined by the mumbling boar Ah, yes, the old mumbling boar. There he is. Uh, how have you been, my good friend? Very well, very well. Yes, you're right. It is a sad time, but, um, you know, we, will, uh, we won't dwell. We will, uh, you know, raise our glass to, uh, to the people who died and hopefully try and cheer everyone else up. Absolutely. It's been a very sobering time, but we always try and sort of look for any joy that we can possibly find. And we're going to try and give you guys out there some of that today. Uh, Tom, as as I understand it, you've been lost in the old wastelands for the past week or so. How have you been getting on with Fallout 4? Fallout 4. It is, uh, you know, if you've you've played Fallout 3, uh, I think people know the score. It's not... I wouldn't say it's a major revelation for those who know Fallout 3. There are tweaks here and there, but it's it you know, it's a step up for sure, but it's it's more of the same but a, a bit better and you know, that's fine because I loved Fallout 3. I am mm. loving Fallout 4. Um honest to god, any spare moment I'm back on it. It's just ridiculously <laughs> addictive. Um there's a few new elements to it that I wasn't too sure about. There's a, a sort of settlement building element to yeah. it, which I was a bit like, hmm, it, is it really what I play this kind of game for? But I'm kind of warming to it, um, getting more into that side of things. And I think ultimately it's going to extend the life of the game, which in itself is a huge game anyway. So, mm. yeah, I am uh, loving Fallout 4 at the minute. Well, people are going to be playing it for years, aren't they? I mean, people are doing the same on the PC, as you know. I sort of recently moved over to more of a PC gaming kind of kind of thing, and um, people are still playing Skyrim. And with with Skyrim, you can get mods that make it look like the best game you've ever, you've ever seen in your life. Mm. Add all sorts of quests in, enhancements, and things like that. So. Even when it's sort of lived its console life, it'll have a life on the PC with all the different mods and things like that. I think they're bringing mods to the Xbox version and eventually the PlayStation version as well. So you're going to get, you know, certainly I think for, for this sort of iteration of, of Fallout, you're going to get all that stuff being added in, um, which is great. I mean, I've, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of it, which is what happens when a really big hyped game arrives. Mm. There's always been that. Uh, I've heard that there are some sort of performance issues on the console, Tom, like some frame rate drops and things like that. Are you experiencing any of that, or has it been running quite smoothly for you? I've not really noticed that. I um, The only things I've noticed is there's been one quest where you... I mean, it's happened in the older games as well, where you can't complete a quest because of some reason, some stupid reason. It can be a bit buggy in that respect, but I've only come across that once. The rest of it's been fine. I've not really seen the frame rate thing um so no it's it's i mean i remember playing fallout new vegas and i had to stop playing the game because the more you got into it the more buggy it got and it was it just i couldn't play the game for three minutes without it crashing or or something it was ridiculous so i never ever finished that game but i'm actually quite surprised that this is pretty good there's a couple of little niggles here and there but Overall, it's uh, it's not bad at all. Oh, nice. Well, I mean, I've got the game on, on PC. I um, bought it for £42 with the season pass. It's been quite difficult for me. You know, there's so much hype going around. I want to play it very badly, but I've kind of resolved it as much as it's killing me to... Uh, you know, wait for a few months, let let some of the big bugs be, be sorted out. And then, you know, you, I'm one of those people, I waited about six months to play Skyrim and it was torture. Mm. 
But by the end of it, you know, I played a game that was in a, in a much better state. And um, right now I'm going through uh, The Witcher 2, uh-huh. which is, uh, I'm a big fan of The Witcher games. I uh, completed the first one earlier this year. Um, playing the second one again, I'd already finished it on the Xbox many years ago, but playing it on the PC now and then hopefully going to move over to Witcher 3. So I'm hoping that those sort of tied me over until, you know, some of those bugs get fixed up and I can move on to Fallout. And then chances are you'll still be playing it by the time I'm doing that, Tom. Well, hopefully. It's, it seems to be a way of life rather than just a game at the minute. It's uh... Absolutely. People live in, live in those worlds, don't yeah. they? And with the DLC that's coming out as well, uh, there's a very strong possibility that we'll never hear from you again in the future, Tom. <laughs> I think you might be right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's what we've been up to, uh, turning this into a gaming podcast, aren't we? Slowly but surely, that's what it's that's what it's becoming. Uh, Tom, we uh, were discussing on the po- previous two episodes a bunch of slasher movies, mm. and uh, you know, g- getting back to horror there. Uh, but now we're moving away from horror, and we're coming a very different uh, subject, different theme altogether. Of course, that's our thing. That's what we do on this show. Uh, Tom, what's the theme for this episode? Well, it's. Uh... Not a million miles away from Fallout and so on, especially in one of the films, sort of. Um, but we've got a war theme, another one of those little paths off to Section 3 list that takes us away from horror, and w- I think we always like them. Um, yeah. But we've got two films. We've got Aftermath, which is a sort of post-apocalyptic um, film. The, the war's already happened, I guess, in that one. Um, and we have The Last Hunter, which is a, a Vietnam movie, but it's uh, maybe a little different from any other Vietnam movie I've ever saw. So, are you are you a fan of war films, Chris? I like a few of them. You know, it's not not a, uh, a genre that I'm. You know, I'm sort of interested in the historical aspect of it more than the movie itself. Mm. Uh, but you know, I have there are some that I really love. You know, I I love. Uh, I mean, for example, the TV show Band of Brothers is one of my very favourite things yeah. to ever exist. I think that's ten perfect episodes of television. I love Platoon, and uh, I'm trying to think now. Uh, Saving Private Ryan. I like Letters from Iwo Jima. So there are, you know, there are some in there that, that, I, that I very much enjoy. But I, I can't say that I'm a, an enthusiast of them necessarily. What, what about yourself? I'm kind of the same. It, if a film sticks out you know kind of puts its head above the the parapet so to speak um it, then yeah absolutely a, a good film is a good film but I, there are people and i know some people who who like military history like the whole military um thing you know they're interested in the artillery the tanks this that, and the other, who seek out war films and you know that's great it's it, same as being a horror fan i guess um but I'm not one of those people. It's more if one really sticks out, then by all means, I'll get onto it. But I can't say I'm a huge fan. There are people who are hugely passionate about it, like you say, in the same way that we are about you know horror movies and uh, and exploitation and cult movies and the like. And uh, so I definitely understand it. You know, it's just not not a genre. It's a bit like westerns for me. You know, I'm not really into westerns that much. There are a couple that I like that sort of stand out to me, good ones. But um, overall, just not you know not something that I really pay a tremendous amount of attention to. But like I say, of, of everything I've seen, Band of Brothers is the one that I always seem to go back to every year. And, um, and and really enjoy and really feel for the people in that, the real life people um, who those actors are portraying. And um, yeah, so I find it very interesting, uh, you know, and I watch documentaries about World War Two and and uh, and things like that. But yeah, not really a genre that I've I've been too interested in sort of discovering. So it's been interesting to 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 watch these, certainly. I mean, I think you can you can make the argument that perhaps Aftermath, which we're going to cover in just a moment here, isn't quite doesn't quite fit into that theme. But obviously there are elements of it there. And uh, The Last Hunter, I think, pr- probably does so a lot more. But let's get into that now, Tom. Let's uh, let's discuss that. Why don't you tell us all about Aftermath? Okay. Aftermath, also known as The Aftermath, and Zombie Aftermath, released in 1982, directed by Steve Barquette, also written by Steve Barquette and Stanley Livingston. Three astronauts are preparing their return to Earth, shacked up in a spaceship as they await any news from the planet ahead of them. It seems that Earth has been completely silent, with the astronauts clueless as to what's really happening. There's been a nuclear holocaust, a war that's wiped away most human life and destroyed much civilization. The scattered remnants of humanity in one city are now held captive by the villainous Cutter, played by Sid Haig, whose crew 
He orders to kill all the men and capture only the women and children. It's a bleak and dangerous existence. Facing no other choice but to try and make a landing without help, the three astronauts start re-entry and one of them dies from an explosion. Matthews, played by Larry Latham, is feared dead too after another explosion, so only Newman, played by director Steve Barquette, prepares as the spaceship finally crashes into the sea. Newman survives the crash, crawling onto the nearby beach, and here he observes corpses laid out and left to rot. As he prepares to leave the area, he spots Matthews, the only survivor of the crash, and the two band together and camp out for the night. Here, they're attacked by mutated people, their faces disfigured and rotten. They manage to fight the mutants off and prepare to set off again in search of anyone or anything that might be left. The city nearby is virtually destroyed, though remnants of buildings and supplies do exist for them to discover. Meanwhile, Cutter prepares to rape and beat Sarah, a pretty young girl who he's had an eye on since he captured her. Sarah manages to escape with the help of a broken bottle and runs away, holding up in an abandoned house. Matthews sets himself up in a house and Newman ventures out to see what he can find. A radioactive storm has him scurrying into an old house and it's here that he meets the curator, played by Forrest J. Ackerman, and a child named Chris, played by Christopher Barquette. The curator is on the verge of death and so asks Newman to take guardianship of the child and so he does as the curator goes off to bed to prepare for death. Newman and Chris come across a frightened Sarah who shoots at Newman thinking he's one of Cutter's men. With the situation calmed down and a couple of pesky mutants dealt with when they come for Chris, love blossoms between Newman and Sarah. Between the three of them and Matthews, a plan is formed where they'll take the fight to Cutter. However, Cutter has plans of his own and what follows is a battle between Cutter's forces and the lone gunman, Newman, out for revenge. Boy, it's a big camp. It's going to be fortified on all four sides. And here are where the weapons and munitions are kept. And here is where he keeps the women and children prisoners. Cutter himself holds up at this side of the camp, and the rest of his men, they're, they're scattered all over the place. Uh, Cutter's got a second in command. Uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but I saw him. Gatman. Do you really think just the three of us can bring this off? Well, it isn't going to be any picnic. But once this laser starts firing, Cutter's going to think Patton's army is crawling up his backside. But it'll have to be a surprise attack. And everyone will have to be in absolute synchronization. This includes you too, Chris. Let's go over this again. Then, after we've done it about ten more times, we make our move. All right, Chris, I think a first for you, a first for me as well. So what did you think mm -hmm. of Aftermath? My goodness. Well, Steve Barquette, you got to hand it to him. He uh, tried his best, didn't he? <laughs> he, uh, he really did. What this film is about to me is it's a very low budget thing, uh, but it's all about effort. It's about really trying to do the best that you possibly can do with a very limited amount of money. You know, I think he had about 2p <laughs> mm -hmm. and he put it together, you know, sort of quite reasonably well. I have to say, Tom, that uh, as a sort of general overview of this to begin with, uh, I sort of quite enjoyed bits of it. You mm. know, there's a lot of problems in this, a lot of problems. But, uh, you know, and you've, you know, you've got the director of the movie. Not only does he direct it and write it, but he puts himself in as the lead star, you know, uh, which you've you got to think is a bit of a it's a bit of a male fantasy, isn't it? You know, I'm going to write myself in as an action hero. And at the end, I'm going to shoot loads of these people like Commando, you know, like Arnie Schwarzenegger. It, it is. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really fit into the war theme as such. It's more the sort of post-war, if you like, definitely fits into more of that sort of post-apocalyptic category. I guess you could say they were di these were a dime a dozen in the you know the 70s through the 80s as well but it's got a real charm to it this movie i can't pretend that i i liked all of it there were bits where i was like oh god this is a bit boring isn't it but mm. it sort of would perk itself up now and again and it, it is man they were trying weren't they they were really trying to make a, a cool post-apocalyptic film with a limited budget and they 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 did not quite get in there really there are a lot of areas that they let it down but <laughs> they were trying and you know i enjoyed seeing the effort yeah yeah 
You know, if you cross Planet of the Apes with Night of the Living Dead with a touch of Buck Rogers in the 25th century, then I think you'll probably get something close to Aftermath. It, you're right, it's, it's all about effort. It's the kind of movie where you see the poster and it's, you know, this... I'm looking at it right now, this sort of war-ravaged landscape with the planet in the air. You've got these horrible mutants in the background... You've got our um, our hero, bare-chested, you know, broad-shouldered, very um, maybe what's the what's the word? I guess a a very sympathetic view of our hero. You know, I think the yeah, oh yeah, they uh, maybe slap on a bit more muscle than he he's actually got in it. But you know, the poster promises so much you know spaceships in the sky and everything and then you watch the thing and you know you know they have made it for about 20p but (laughs) within itself it seems to have a a certain vibe about it that that's been created in this this low budget and it's it is the the very rich colors the uh the matte paintings that are beautiful but look like matte paintings you know yeah. And it, it does create its own kind of atmosphere that I, I really did kind of enjoy. But you're right, it, that at times it, it does get a bit boring. Our hero is a bit of a charisma vacuum at times. He's very much setting himself up as this this pure as pure hero who just sort of speaks in cliches and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you know, there's ups and downs, but... It, it has got charm and it is quite enjoyable. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's not bad at all. Well, there are lots of little things to get into here, but I've got to say, you mentioned those matte paintings. When you see those, these sort of static shots of these buildings that have been destroyed and the land looks like it's been just ravaged by these nuclear blasts and things like that and the skies are all grey and everything and then it like cuts to the actual film itself to live action shots and it's beautiful blue skies up there (laughs) it's lovely sunshine and everything you know foliage everywhere you look the earth looks very healthy when they're actually shooting the film as soon as you see those matte paintings it it paints you know rather a different picture so to speak but it's uh yeah you know effort that's what we can say about it effort and steve barquette was obviously not a particularly good actor it's funny you know this film is a lot of people really seem to hate this movie i mean if you look on imdb a lot of people think this is one of the worst movies i've ever seen and i just don't for me that doesn't really compute uh, and i don't even see him as being particularly bad he's not good but you know i thought he was a decent enough you know clearly like i say it's the male fantasy thing you know i'm going to write myself in as the lead star here it's my bloody movie i'm going to direct it. i'm going to write the script and i'm going to be you know yeah. the tough guy it, uh, now i will i will say uh, sorry Tom, uh, what were you going to say there? i was just going to say it reminds me a little bit of um when david brent made that pop video you know that that <laughs> level of kind of he, he's obviously got a bit of a view of himself which isn't quite uh, in tune with probably what everyone else thinks, you know. Exactly, but this is the sort of platform through which he can at least present this sort of fantasy version of himself, and in yeah. that respect, I think it works quite well. I mean, let's let's sort of go through the plot here, but very early on. So, we're, well, let's start at the beginning. So, we, we, of course, we're seeing this spaceship here, and there are three astronauts inside it. At the beginning, I was thinking, oh, is this going to go a little bit Star Wars here? But it, it, it doesn't, because I was thinking this is going to be super futuristic, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, it's not a bad shot, really, of a spaceship flying, considering that he had, oh, what, 200 grand to, to work with, which is not really a lot of money. Um, not a bad little space effect, is it, really? And you, so, you sort of, you know, you can tell that they're basically inside a, a, a box, yeah. <laughs> uh, the three of them. But, you know, it wasn't badly handled, was it, the opening scene? I quite like that idea of uh, the astronauts being up there and trying to get some sort of signal from Earth, you know, to hear from you know, control and command so that they can get help in order to, to re-enter Earth and they just can't get anybody. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not bad, but I think it's probably came at a time post-Alien and post-Star Wars where I think even at the time people might have been a bit like, mm, it's a bit creaky, isn't it, you know? Yeah. Um, it, sometimes there are these massive leaps in, in technology and uh, filmmaking techniques things like Alien and, and Star Wars that all of a sudden renders a lot of other things a bit cheap and stuff like that. Um, and I think this probably came at the 
the wrong time for old Steve and his um his little spaceship there. But it's funny that why he had to be away from the Earth at all. You know, I I guess it's a storytelling thing where he could say he was away while the war happened and he came, comes back and the Earth is devastated. But the sort of science fiction element, apart from a bit of laser gun here and there, goes quite quickly, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And also, it's funny because I think later on in the movie they sort of state that they've only been away for five years. Oh, really? So within f- <laughs> within five years, you know, this nuclear warfare has happened rather quickly and they've wiped almost everyone away. But yeah, I think he sort of explains that he, he went away. Obviously, it's just it's a story that's been devised to give him a reason for not being there when, when you know, everything goes to shit. But... Uh, you know, his his wife and his child had died, and therefore he just felt like, well, look, I've got nothing, no, got really nothing left for me on Earth. I'm going to go off and, and join this mission. And they, you know, crash land back onto Earth, the least realistic re-entry mm. um, to Earth we can imagine, uh, doing it all by themselves. But uh, hey, Sandra Bullock did it in, uh, what was that movie now? Uh, another, uh, Gravity. Yeah, yeah. Gravity, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's possible. <laughs> and um, yeah, crash lands there crawls on out of the old spaceship, thinks he's alone there, and uh, turns out that Matthews is also alive. Uh, he was the, I guess he was the pilot. And, um, well, certainly he was doing something down there in a blackened room by himself, um, but he's he's still alive, and the two of them sort of hole up there, camp out. And this is when we, you know, camping out there around a fire, and this is when we get introduced to what people seem to describe as zombies. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, Tom. I... I I never saw them as zombies. I always saw them as just sort of mutated people. There's not really any, apart from the look of them and their faces being quite rotten, they don't really behave like zombies. No, no, not at all. They they are a bit more like mutanty type of uh, things, aren't they? They're quite um, absent in the film. They're not really the, the full mm. thrust of it, are they? They're, they're kind of like in the background. They'll pop in every now and again and, and get wiped out by... Um, good old uh, Steve and yeah they don't really play that much of a part they they don't seem to be much of a threat for the most part apart from bits here and there you can understand why they might have sort of alternatively titled it zombie aftermath because it's you know that's a selling point mm. but really from what I can remember they only turn up twice I think yeah you know once during that campfire scene and another when they're they're chasing old Chris around I was very confused Tom with the uh, with that character of Chris, you you know I'm a very egotistical man, and I don't like it when other people are named the same as me. I was bitterly confused by it and disappointed <laughs> by the film because, as you know, Tom, if you look at my Twitter account, for example, I'm I'm so full of myself. I just never stop talking about myself. This is true. This is true. But you know, at least you're not a mumbling bore. So there is that. There is that, isn't there, Tom? There is that. That's you, mm. not me. Uh, so, yeah, Tom, you, you, you're right. They really don't show up that much, do they, uh, at all through the whole thing? Really, the, the, the major villain here, of course, is, is Cutter and his gang. Now, Cutter, played by... Our old friend Sid Haig. That's right, who is you know something of a genre exploitation mainstay at this point. Uh, I don't know how you feel about this, Tom. Uh, I've seen a bunch of Sid Haig movies. I can't pretend that I've seen you know all of his work or anything. He's made a lot of movies, but... Uh, I thought this just might have been his worst performance uh, of any movie I've seen him in. Really, how do you feel about it? Um, I don't know. I, th- I think it was probably one of the better things in the film. He- he's quite effortless in his his menace, Sid Haig. He, can- he is, yeah. He can bring it quite easily. Um, so I thought he was all right, um, especially next to Newman, who who is a bit of a charisma vacuum, our, our leading man. I suppose we'll talk about him in a minute. But yeah, it, it was just. It- bit of a, a strange one really seeing old Sid pop up in this because uh, but I guess he's done a, he's a hard working guy wasn't he especially in those days yeah I mean, we'll get to some trivia about him later on we're kind of done with the review portion as we always do and you'll, you'll hear some things about that this was sort of the, one of the last films he did for quite a while actually so uh, it's interesting no I mean I'll give you that certainly he has that weird menacing charisma to him mm. And that grin as well, you know. Whenever he grins, I, I said, I said this before, uh, said this to you before, because we were, of course, we were covering, uh, what was it? I think it was Foxy Brown, wasn't it? We were covering, mm-hmm. or was it Coffee that we covered? No, it was Foxy Brown. Foxy Brown. Um, and he yeah. was in, he was in that. And I said at the time, you know, you can understand why, you know, his wife is like thirty years younger than him because he's got that sort of, you know, that grin. You can tell that he just knows how to charm his way into a set of panties. <laughs> 
uh, so it's not to be too crude about it but uh but yeah I, I i just thought that he didn't have a lot to say though he didn't have a lot of dialogue really and yeah a decent enough menace but those are the real villains really cutter's crew of course as you can imagine they're they're uh, kidnapping people kidnapping women and men killing the men um and we've got to talk uh, tom really about that execution scene at the beginning because here i was as a scene where they line up all these men and they and cutter's crew he, he orders them to dispose of them and he kills them one by one and the effects are they're not great but they're quite gory they are yeah uh-huh it's um it can be quite brutal at times the movie which is good but i think that the first maybe third is quite decent quite pacey set up quite nicely we see these great shots of the ruined earth and so on but i think after that it, it begins to lose steam a bit for me it um mm-hmm. it's here that we we start to get a bit a bit bogged down and a bit slow and uh you know newman is there's really no no kind of light and dark to newman he, he's just he's just there <laughs> yeah. and, uh, he's just the nicest man in the world yeah with no real personality to him yeah he spends quite a bit of the middle of the film just sort of walking around <laughs> looking at stuff yeah. and we get that scene in the museum don't we and this is where you know th- th- some of the people in this movie are some of the most trusting people i've ever seen because we meet this guy named the curator played by forrest j ackerman who's a very popular genre actor very well known by people and he comes in and in the space of 15 minutes explains to newman what's going on he explains to newman that he's about to die and tells newman who he's only just met about 15 20 minutes <laughs> earlier uh, that you should take care of this young boy uh, for me and you know newman's like i will take care of this boy for as long as i live and then pops off to bed and, and that's the last we see of him that's right uh, the most trusting man you've only known this man for 20 minutes he might be a child abuser or a rapist no 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 they, he hands that boy over and that, and he basically becomes his son. Now, of course, in real life, that actually was played by uh, by Steve Barquette's real son, Christopher. Mm. Uh, but it is, and then later on, you know, we're going to talk about the Sarah character in a minute. Something very similar similar happens where people are very trusting of old Newman, aren't they? Well, they are. I don't know whether it's his big forehead or his walrus like moustache. I don't know, but they are very trusting of him. Maybe it's because he is just so calm and collected and. And stuff, but um, I mean, Forry Ackerman, I think he's probably less of a big deal in England because we never got the magazine, um, Famous Monsters of Filmland, which he created, which was probably the first or one of the first horror magazines that really came at it with a fan's eye, the way um, you know, we approach it kind of thing, or you know, with a love of the material, like from Universal Monsters onwards, it was. Forry Ackerman, who was um, the man behind it, and if you if you talk to people like Peter Jackson um, and stuff like that, they have a real love for this man. But I I just don't think he's quite as much of a big deal over here because we probably never got that magazine, or if we did, you'd probably have to pay money for it because it was imported mm. from America. So yeah, Forrest J. Ackerman, I think for the Americans, it's it's probably gonna mean a lot more to them but um yeah so he hands this kid over and uh, <laughs> promptly just pops off to bed and dies <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that's the end of it this man he's just met he entrusts this young child to now but i mean we know as the audience that newman is a swell guy mm. and uh you know pretty much adopts him as his son more or less you know he's laying down in bed with him like look i'm gonna look after you forever kind of <laughs> and um, you there. know <laughs> and um Tom, you're taking it there. I'm a, you know me. I'm a clean Christian man, uh, or not really. But, uh, but yeah. So you have you have that moment. But around that point, I have to agree with you. I was getting quite bored when he was sitting in the museum and everything. And then they've got this, you know, the, these uh, colourful dream sequences that where mm. he's, you know, sort of seeing his old family and everything there. And and you know, the, the museum seems quite sort of interesting shots in there and lighting and things like that. But it, it starts to get a bit dull. Uh, we talked about this character named Sarah. Mm. So she is the the sort of the the female lead, I suppose, if you like, this young girl who nearly gets raped by Cutter. Um, interesting scene there. I thought she was going to sort of jab the broken bottle into his neck. Yeah. Uh, but then you know that would be the end of Sid Haig, of course, and he's supposed to be the the main villain in there. Um, 
so we we find Sarah later on. Uh, Newman and Chris are sort of travelling together. They walk towards this house and they get shot at. And uh, it turns out, you know, he sort of manages to sneak on in there because she has really, really bad aiming. Mm. Uh, and uh, manages to get in there. It, it's astonishing, by the way. Later on, you'll see, like, Newman's aiming is astonishing. Like, he can take out anybody with one <laughs> shot. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. Obviously, she can't. He sneaks in there and it turns out, oh, this is Sarah. <laughs> it is quite remarkable how quickly they become lovers, Tom. It, it must be, what, th- three or four hours? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Maybe. it's Newman, isn't it? Have you seen the cover oh. of this DVD? Look at the chest on this man. He's got a great... Lo- oh, Tom, you're getting me going. <laughs> it's got a, he's got a lovely hairy chest, thinning hair up top, and Tom, the pièce de résistance, mm-hmm. the moustache. Exactly. That glorious, fluffy moustache. You can imagine it tickling your ivories <laughs> or your clitoris. And uh, it is an it is an astonishing, an astonishing thing really that he manages to bed this young girl, yeah. attractive old but attractive old Newman. Uh, but who am I to say anything? I look like a ball bag on legs, so uh, I, uh, no reason to insult him whatsoever. But uh, we see the zombie creatures again. I'd say zombie creatures more like mutants again. I quite like the design of them, Tom. I mean, how do you feel about that? The- um, yeah, they're quite fleeting, I suppose, but they've got like big, big sort of uh, deformed faces, haven't they? And they're okay. They, they should have made a bit more of them, really, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah, once they're there, they're okay. Yeah, they're, they're, I would describe them as more of an irritant, really, mm. than anything else. Like they, like I say, I think this is, I think from what I can remember, this is the last time in this scene that we even see them. So um, you know, that that's about it, really. I might be wrong about that, but I can't, I can't quite remember. But I think it, it's the last time we uh we see them but uh so yeah so we have that so we get a love scene between a good old newman and uh sarah and <laughs> you know within a couple of nights they're already expressing love for each other i've never felt this way about anybody you know since the death of my wife and of course, <laughs> you you know what that means tom you mean somebody's gonna die mm. <laughs> um with this expression of love in the wastelands and uh, it does fit in very well with the fallout theme now that i think of it yeah um uh, would you play a game based on this movie There'd be a lot of walking in that game, wouldn't it? <laughs> Just a lot of sort yeah. of walking around with a kid next to you. So, but Tom, Tom, you'd get to play as Newman. There is that, there is that. Just bedding lovelies all over the wasteland. Mm, uh, okay. There's always a bright side. <laughs> there's always a bright side. So so you said, Tom, that you're you're at this point in the film, you're kind of bored, really. Yeah, off, when, off and on. Yeah. yeah, so is there a point, because there is for me, because I'm kind of with you. I'm sort of like, I'm checking out a little bit at this point because it's slowed down a bit. We get to we get back to Matthews, who's the other astronaut, and they're sort of formulating a plan now. They're going to get revenge on Cusser. Was there a point for you, as there was for me, where it started to sort of rev up a bit again? Possibly. I'm not sure if it's going to be the same with you as it is with me, but I think Newman, our friend Newman, was supposed to be this... Uh, this good man driven to the edge <laughs> and you know he's going to take his revenge and I love stuff like that in movies you know mm. I love Death Wish 1 and 2 the others are a bit silly um, I know in 2 he's a bit of a killer machine but in the first one if you go back to that movie and I mean I think people look back on Charlie Bronson as just this killer machine in those days and he was in a lot of them but in that first movie, he's just a normal guy. He's just an architect, mm. and he's, he's what you know. The first time he kills someone, he goes and throws up because, uh, you know. So, I do love that the good guy who gets pushed to the edge and and ends up killing a load of people. Um, and I think there's a point, um, where Steve wants us to think Newman is is at that point, and it's when he's carrying a dead child in his arms. <laughs> walking towards the camera yeah which happens because you know we sort of hinted at him you know we we said in the the synopsis that he wanted to get revenge the reason he wants to get revenge is because of course he's in love with sarah that that, why tom the mere night before they've declared love for each other Mm -hmm. uh, laying there in bed together naked tickling his moustache yeah and um, (laughs) and uh you know tickling the old ivories i'll stop there Mm -hmm. and uh the next day he goes out with the kid of course conveniently and Cutter and his men, well, not Cutter, but Cutter sends his men out to the house and they break in and they kill everybody in there except for Matthews, who gets knocked out. 
they kill Sarah. They kill one of the girls that was rescued and her daughter. So yeah, the the child that you, you're speaking of is this this girl's daughter. Yeah. And of course Newman comes in, and you can tell from that moment he swears revenge. That's right. And nothing nothing's going to stand in his way, Tom. And and I think what happens is, do you remember the the uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Commando? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a big section of that movie where basically he's walking around a, a base. And people are shooting at him left, right, and centre. Nobody hits him, mm. and he takes out everybody with a seemingly never-ending barrage of bullets. And it, it it kind of it sort of now this was actually released before Commando. I think Commando came out in eighty three, eighty four. Right. Um, so I'm not saying that was an influence, but it goes a bit like that, doesn't it? If it if there was a low a super low budget Commando, this would kind of be it, wouldn't it? It would. Uh, and the thing is, hell bent on revenge, Newman, seething with rage, looks quite similar to Newman sitting down and watching a bit of telly. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's not that much difference between those two moods with him. So he, he sort of calmly walks around dispatching people. And yet, but, you know, fair play though. It, it kicks up a notch and it's, you know, it's fun. Um, so I'm okay with it, you know. It starts to get going again, and I do start to enjoy it again. Yeah, well, that's where I I, I say, you know, because I think you were expecting me to say that all of a sudden I love this movie because, you know, it picks up. You know, I, I like I say, I enjoy bits of it, mm. and I, I I quite like the final shootout. It's so stupid, you know. Like I say, it, it, as soon as Newman's there, he goes on his own. Great idea, uh, into a camp full of people. But this is Newman, Tom. Okay, it's Newman, the unsung action hero of the day. Mm. And he goes in there, and he manages to kill everybody with one bullet each. <laughs> it's an ast- it's an ast- it's an astonishing thing. Uh, apart from a guy towards the end who we're going to talk about because there's some ridiculousness there, but almost everybody in there, they fall over after just one bullet. It doesn't matter where he shot them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be in the knee. <laughs> if they get shot in the knee, they're going to fall over dead because Newman is just that powerful. I'm sure he sort of empowers the bullets even with his. Uh, Oh, what can we say, Tom, with his, the surge of his manly power? Right, right down his arm, through the gun, into the bullet. Yep. yep. Don't forget, Tom, before all of this happened, at one point, Sarah, when she was still alive, fired a laser gun. That's right. Uh, <laughs> with the only laser gun we see in the movie. Yeah. It's almost like they thought, look, this is supposed to be in the future. Why don't you just fire something that looks vaguely futuristic at somebody for a while? And then we never see it again. <laughs> And uh, nobody ever fires anything, any such thing, again in the movie. It's uh, an astonishing. Where did she get it from? I don't know. I don't know. There is one particular scene, and I, I think it's something you've just alluded to, where Newman kind of stalks this guy. That now, what happens was, uh, what was Newman's friend called? Matthews. Matthews comes and helps Newman out because, you know, hard as he is, he gets overpowered by three guys. Uh-huh. Matthews comes along and shoots them, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. But then <laughs> someone takes out Matthews, and you see this uh, this guy with a big moustache and a vest, you know, uh, in the distance, and he smiles because he's just taken out Matthews. But then Newman pushes Matthews' dead body off him, and he looks over, and the guy goes, "Oh fuck!" And he yeah. he scarpers, doesn't he? And Newman goes after him. Well, we should say, Tom, the fantastically heroic uh, final line from Matthews, which we have to say here, when Mm. Matthew comes in, of course, and Newman says to him, why did you come? And Matthew says, I just did. (laughs) And immediately dies. (laughs) A great fight, a fitting honourable death for the man. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) I just did. Bang. Uh, So, yes, you're right. The guy who killed Matthews, instead of looking for Cutter, who I thought was the main villain this. We then spent about 10 minutes with Newman buggering off into some sort of town, mm. some, or some sort of city rather, to the rooftops of the city to uh, chase this one dude, mm. uh, this beardy dude. And then we get, they have a, a fight up on the roof there and we get the hilarious scene of Newman uh, firing the least powerful pump action shotgun I think there's ever been manufactured, <laughs> Tom. He shoots him pretty close in both legs, mm. 
with a minor bullet wound that doesn't seem to phase him that much. Now, you would think, Tom, uh, I don't, perhaps you can tell me, perhaps you, you, you're more of an expert in this than I am. I don't know. You may have an armory of your own preparing for the Great War ahead. I really don't know. I don't. All I've got is a bunch of Blu-rays. I may throw them at people. That may get them out of the way. I can't be sure. Hmm. Uh, but you've got to try everything, Tom. In, in a war, and I expect World War Three to arrive pretty soon, You've got to try whatever you can. I'll throw my PlayStation at somebody if it means that I can escape with my life intact because I'm very egotistical. Mm. Uh, what do you think of that particular scene, Tom? Unrealistic? Unrealistic, but strangely entertaining. <laughs> um, Newman sort of walks towards him, and I swear there's about, must be about three or four metres between them. Yeah. But when Newman's walking towards you, he will make three or four metres Take about mm. ten minutes to get there. He'll walk that yeah. slow just to fuck you up, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, shoots him in both legs, but he's not too bothered by that because he runs around a bit after that. So it's <laughs> it's okay. But you know, he uh, he can't escape Numa forever. I still can't get over that, Tom. A point blank, near near enough point blank blank shot to both legs. Leg doesn't blow off or anything, no. and he just walks it off. <laughs> you know, he just walks it off. But anyway, Newman manages to dispatch of him and. At this point, I was sort of, I was sort of thinking, okay, well, what's going to happen with Cutter? Has he let him go? Because he goes back to the kid. Now, it's only him and the kid left. Sarah, of course, is dead. Matthew's died after uttering that hero- heroic line. I'll repeat it once again. I just did. Mm. Bang. Goodbye, Matthews. And they sort of set off together. And uh, he says something to the effect of... He says a voiceover which makes it sound like he must have survived in the future to be able to tell the story. But he... Uh, spoiler, folks. He dies at the end of this movie. So how could... Where was the voiceover coming from? I don't really understand. Because <laughs> it almost sounded like he was telling the story to somebody else. But how could he have been doing that when, you know, I don't really understand. But anyway, he says he's going to take this child off somewhere safe. Uh, Chris, of course, is his name. Same name as mine. Haha. <laughs> and uh, he, yeah. And he, yeah, I'm very, I'm very intelligent, Tom. You see how I work that out? Uh, and we get a final showdown with Cutter. Now, I actually thought this was quite an interesting sort of ending to this, where Cutter... Uh, surprises him and shoots him a couple of times and I sort of thought okay I didn't really expect it to go this way I thought it was kind of going to go the predictable way he's going to find Cutter of course he's going to kill him take his revenge he and the boy you know walk off into the sunset to you know some sort of unknown future and uh, it doesn't happen that way Cutter you know gets his revenge and 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 you know pretty much you know leaves him for dead but then we get this shot of you know earlier on in the film we've seen Newman kind of teach Chris how to fire a gun and he says you know he's not very good at distance but you know sort of reasonably close up he's got accuracy like I've never seen before mm. and it's the kid who comes along Chris and he shoots Cutter dead that's right you know and Cutter's all like oh god damn it <laughs> and, and and dies and uh, how do you feel about that ending there Tom because I thought it was sort of quite interesting that the, the final shot of the movie is this kid alone his guardian dead, just sort of walking off to some unknown future that we don't, you know, will he, he could walk half a mile down the road and get, you know, run over by somebody. <laughs> or he could grow up to be, you know, John Connor. You know, we just don't know what, what's going to happen. How did you feel about that? You're right, it was unexpected. I was never expecting Newman to die. Considering it, it seems to me a bit of a vanity project, yeah. Let's let's not mince our words here. You know, it's it is a bit like David Brent putting himself in a pop video. You know, as as this rock star, you've got this, and I, I I don't mean to be rude about anyone, but he's not your typical action hero. No. So maybe that's fine. You know, maybe it's good that other types get their moment to be an action hero, and that that's fine. But the the thing is, he. He very much believes himself to be that action hero, I think. Um, and then he gets shot at the end. So I wasn't expecting it because I thought it would be at the end, it'd be like Newman, you know, staring across the landscape with a kid by his side. He's probably picked up some other young babe in the meantime, you know, <laughs> and she's sort of slunk, slinking next to him. And he's like, okay, let's go, you know, but it, it doesn't. It's, it's the kid walking away. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a strange ending, but it's a strange film in a way. Yeah, strange and quite surprising, I think. Mm. You know, like you say, definitely a vanity project. And and look, like I can't really blame him because, you know, he directed it, he, he co-wrote it. 
he put himself in the lead role you know so clearly it was an effort was you know what i'm going to be a badass today mm -hmm. and i can't blame him for that really no, you know, no. in a way uh, i can't blame him for that but yeah quite a surprising end to it and and something i liked it but it just is it's got a lot of problems to it you know it, it it's I just feel like that it, his heart was in the right place when he was putting this together. And I think he tried his best with a very, very limited budget. Mm. And uh, I don't know, would I watch it again? I don't know. You know, I was sort of, sort of thinking about that since yesterday, really. Would I watch it again? I don't know. But I can't say that I sat there. I, I certainly I can't understand why some people think this is one of the worst things I've ever seen. No. You know, I think it's it's deeply flawed and, and has a lot of problems. And it's slow in places where you're like, oh, God, I kind of want to give up on this. But then... You know, it does some things. I think that shootout at the end is just really entertaining and daft and, and you know, the product of <laughs> a man who thinks he's a badass, you know, yeah. in real life probably. And who, you know, casts his own son as his son in the movie, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. He just is a... Uh... I enjoyed a, a good few bit chunks of this, you know. I think it is. it was surprisingly, you know, better. I really thought this was going to be terrible. And uh, I don't think it was, really. I think it's got some terribly cheesy moments in it and cheesy dialogue. I don't think the acting is awful across the board by any means. And, uh, you know, Sid Haig, a, a decent villain in it. Um, for me, it's sort of, you know, bits of it work quite well. Like I say, no, nothing nothing terribly great, but some surprising elements to it, you know. I, 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 I sort of enjoyed bits of it, yeah. No, nothing that I would... I would rate highly or, or suggest that you go you know spend 25 30 quid quid on to try and track it down anywhere but uh yeah you know a de decent serviceable watch with some effort i think really really put into uh to try and make it more than what it was that's right i think he he did well for what he had and you're right i enjoyed bits of it i enjoyed the kind of world that it created creaky as it was in places but it, it sort of took on its own vibe it's slightly artificial but um quite visually interesting as well i you know i would love to hear steve barquette talk about this i looked on the net for interviews you know mm -hmm. are there any interviews out there where he talks about it i'd be interested to kind of hear him talk about it and if you know you never know steve barquette might be listening to us right now and if you are steve Give us a call and uh, let's talk a bit of aftermath. But um, yeah, and just tr try if you can, Steve, to forget all the things we said about your moustache and your thinning hair and uh, lack of all charisma. the insults, <laughs> yeah, lack of charisma, all the things that Tom pointed out. That of course I, w I wasn't in agreement with at all, Steve. I'm on your side. Uh, Tom is the enemy, not me. I'm uh, I I'm with you, Steve. Me and Steve, tight like that. Cross my fingers. In case you, <laughs> obviously, you can't see. Uh, Tom, one final thing then that we need to talk about. Mm the the film has a full orchestral score yeah and um it's by a man whose name i forgot to write down i think it was john hewton um, who i've seen has done a few bits and pieces nothing sort of massive i think he sort of rescored a few bits for some bigger films but uh, and it's a very bombastic score isn't it for a film that's quite low-key yeah very overwhelming at times i would imagine a bit of a synthy Thing might have fitted this a bit better uh, but then a lot of these films did that you see uh, there were a lot of italian films in this sort of post-apocalyptic genre sub-genre if you like and a lot of them sort of did that so i quite enjoy i know it's quite overbearing but i sort of enjoyed that it was it was a very different score to the kind of thing we get it's a full-on orchestral thing and it gets very busy and and very <laughs> energetic a lot of the time but i don't know i sort of came away from thinking, quite enjoying it really I think the thing about the synthy aspect of movies at that time, it's something that's kind of went out and came back in again. It's something that maybe we would have said in the 90s or or something that, oh, that looks, that dates it, you know, that synthy type of score. But it's something that's sort of came back around again to something we, we really love. And I don't know, I think it might have fitted better, but you know it is what it is and and if you liked it that that's cool it it is very intrusive at times though well sure i mean also you know now that you're saying that it makes me think of escape from new york which is another sort of post-apocalyptic kind of film mm -hmm. that has that you know that that amazing synth score the john carpenter score that i just love so yeah uh you know i, so I can you know i could definitely agree with what you're saying i just thought it was quite different really for a movie like this a movie that's this low budget and they actually had a full orchestral score it's quite rare 
I would imagine that uh, old Steve Barquette was probably the conductor. I would imagine so. Mm. I, I reckon Steve did everything on this movie. I reckon that he was holding the microphones, you know, when they were when it, when they were shooting the dialogue. I imagine he edited everything. <laughs> Um, I would imagine he. I imagine he really did have sex with that woman, <laughs> because just to play the part, you know. Because there's a hilarious bit in that where they're standing right next to the bed, and yet he picks her up and then places her on the bed, mm-hmm. which you didn't need to do because she was standing right by the bed, Steve. Because <laughs> just said, <laughs> sit down for her as love. Yeah, can you just you know just lay down? But no, I'm going to pick you up and then place you down just a few centimeters in front of me. Strange thing. Uh, Tom, we've got some trivia, of course. I know that you're just gagging to hear it. So Can't wait. Shall we do it? Right. Well, according to IMDb, Tom, the film was shot in 1978, but it wasn't released until 1982. I don't know what the reason for that is. Not a ton of information about this movie, to be honest. Uh, additionally, $70,000 of the film's $250,000 budget was spent on post-production. Okay, so you can bet that seventy grand of that was spent on making old Steve look good. <laughs> with uh, CG, the early CG, (laughs) 1978 style CG. Uh, Director and leading star Steve Barquette, don't you forget it, right? Mm -hmm. Spent much of the 80s relatively quiet, uh, but then returned in 1990 with his final film as a director, Empire of the Dark. Uh, Barquette would continue to act in films through the 90s, appearing in B-movies with titles, now this is great, such as Wizards of the Demon Sword, Mm -hmm. Bikini Drive-In, Attack of the 60-foot centerfold, an invisible mum, Tom. <laughs> the invisible mum. She wants you to do your homework, Tom, but you can't see. You don't know where she's where she's calling you from, but you can't see her. Uh, make she's sure, invisible. Yeah. Make sure you uh, don't try and uh, get your mags out in the night, you know, in your room. No. Mm. She should be in there watching you, Tom. <laughs> uh, Barquette's son, Christopher, who uh, has got the same name as me, uh, who appears here as the child uh, Newman has to take care of, would also make another appearance in Empire of the Dark, again as the son of Barquette's character. So he didn't want anyone else to be his child in the movie. He was like, look, it's going to be my son or, or no, my way or the highway. Uh, Christopher would later become a production designer and has credits on films since uh, 2012. So, hey, you never know, he might make his name in that film. Now, this is interesting. Lynn Margellis, or Margullies rather, who plays the ill-fated Sarah, is perhaps best known as the partner of legendary avant-garde comedian Andy Kaufman, Ah. living with him up until his death from lung cancer in 1984. She was portrayed by Courtney Love in the film Man on the Moon, which is a film I enjoy very much, with uh, Andy Kaufman played by Jim Carrey. Old Jim Carrey. Yep, old Jim (sighs) Carrey. Remember that? The first victim in... uh, (laughs) What was that movie called? Planet of the Blood Farmers. uh, Invasion of the Blood Farmers. That's it, yeah. Planet of the Apes. <laughs> uh, McGullies would go on to act in. Have you seen Man on the Moon, by the way? Yeah, I love it. The uh, the book's good as well that it was based on. I was quite fascinated by Kaufman for a bit. Yeah, me too. In fact, believe it or not, for for a number of years, I was, I was, I wouldn't say I believed it necessarily, but I, I would read a lot about the all the conspiracy theories about him still being alive yeah, and living yeah. under a different assumed idea. And that was the sort of comedian he was. Now, I mean, I do believe that he actually did die, but. He's a sort of comedian that he was so sort of secretive and, and he played tricks on people. You could almost believe that he would do something like That's that. That's right. Um, really good film. I think Jim Carrey is, is, is brilliant in that role. Mm. Um, and Courtney Love, you know, quite good. And playing the lady who was in this movie. Uh, Margellis would go on to act in one further film, My Breakfast with Blassie, which was a vehicle for... I say go on to act. I think that actually w- was made before this. Uh Uh, My Breakfast with Blassie, which was a vehicle for Kaufman and is where the two met and struck up their relationship. Margulies continues to be an artist, editor and producer to this day. I think you can see her in sort of Andy Kaufman documentaries and things like that. And she married in 2010 to somebody else. Uh, Popular genre actor Sid Haig, of course, plays the villainous role of Cutter. Uh, This is interesting. After the release of the film, Haig mostly stuck to TV roles as a criminal or heavy. They began appearing in a few more films in the late 80s and early 90s. Quentin Tarantino, a recognised fan, of course, of cult movies and exploitation, would cast him in 1997's Jackie Brown, which helped uh, bring him to more modern audiences. But as we all know, it wasn't until 2003's House of a Thousand Corpses, directed by musician Rob Zombie from White Zombie and his own solo work. Uh, his role as the demented Captain Spaulding. That's what finally 
uh, allowed Haig to get the recognition he deserved, which was further cemented by the release of Zombies critically acclaimed The Devil's Rejects in 2005. Uh, Haig has since gone on to star in uh, various independent horror movies and is, is a regular on the horror convention circuit. I think it's fair to say you and I are both big fans of, uh, of his role in those movies. Yeah, he, w- he was good in them. I, I have uh, issues with House of a Thousand Corpses mainly, but mm-hmm. uh, that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, Sid Haig, I always like a bit of Sid Haig. Yeah, House of a Thousand Corpses didn't know how to end it. Mm. I'll just say that much. Uh, perhaps the most successful of all the people, people associated with this film is Larry Latham, who plays Matthews. He didn't get a very good final line, but it seems like his, uh, his career panned out very well. Uh, he's the other astronaut who survives the crash to Earth. Uh, Latham did not act in another film again, but he did go on to be a hugely successful animator and director of animation. Sticking mostly to TV animated shows, Latham began his career with the all-new Popeye Hour, in 1979 and his long and distinguished career saw him serving as a storyboard artist and sometimes a story director for shows such as scooby-doo and scrappy-doo super friends challenge of the go bots which was a if i remember a sort of transformers ripoff uh the smurfs my little pony and friends chip and dale rescue rangers and many more he even directed episodes of tailspin which was the spin-off of jungle book if i remember rightly Mm -hmm. uh and two direct-to-video sequels to An American Tale in the late 90s. Latham won a Primetime Emmy in 1991 for his work on Tailspin and was nominated for his work on The Tick in 1994. That's another animated show. And he sadly passed away in 2014. So there you go. Of all the people, he's the one who uh, got the last laugh, really. <laughs> I would say. He went on to be a very successful animator. So there you go. That's Aftermath. Uh, not terribly easy to find on DVD, really. I'm going to sort of present my findings here, and then I'll pass you over to Tom, who actually found the copy that we watched. Uh, unless you're willing to buy an import copy from the US. In that case, there's a DVD release from the Nautilus Film Company. Uh, that may be region restricted. There's also a DVD release of the film on eBay under the title Zombie Aftermath, um, which I had a look at. This is also an American Region 1 release, although there's not enough information available to ascertain whether or not it's an original or bootleg copy. It didn't really have much info on there. Uh, there are plenty of copies there, though, available uh, at under £19. Now, Tom, uh, how successful were you at finding a copy of this? Um, it was quite easy. I, I got it from Amazon on one of the you know, the, the sellers underneath the, the main thing, I think. And I got that Nautilus Films release. It is bare bones. There's nothing in the way of extras on it. And it's region free. It looks okay. Yeah, it looks fine. I don't... You know, it's not like uh, crystal clear or anything, but it, it looks okay. So it'll soon be going on eBay for anyone who wants it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, not too hard to find. But it, unfortunately, you probably have to pay more for it than the film is actually worth. This is the trouble, isn't it? That some of these obscure films, even if we recommend them, you know, sometimes it can be like, do you really want to pay out like 20, 25 quid for the film? You know. Mm. It's one of those things, isn't it? But um, but yeah, aftermath. I think we can sort of agree that there was a you know good amount of effort behind it, and um, I think I liked it a bit more than you, Tom. But overall, not a bad thing at all. They were trying, weren't they? Absolutely. You know, a for effort. I think. Okay, so it's time for us to move away from old Newman. I'm sad to say, perhaps someday, maybe not on this show, unless any of his films happen to be on the, well, he only made one more film, didn't he? So I guess the chances are pretty low, really. But you never know. One day, Tom, we may happen upon one of. Barquette's other works uh, as an actor or the other one that he made as a director but for now we move away from that and uh, really I think explore a film that fits in more comfortably uh, into the war theme that we've been uh, presenting here on this episode Uh, I'm going to tell you about a film called The Last Hunter now it's also known as Hunter of the Apocalypse it was released in 1980 directed by Antonio Margarete Tom Margarete Mm. Uh, I'm not just saying that to make fun of Italian people. Do you remember... Uh, in fact, let me say that again. I wasn't saying that to make fun of Italian people at all. Do you remember... Uh, I believe it was Eli Roth or someone like that pronounced that name in that way in the Tarantino film Glorious Bastards. Is that right? Do you remember that? Yeah, he had a thing where he would say, Margarete. Ah, it's been a while yeah. since I've watched it. I do like that movie, though. Yeah, so do I. I. And I'm wondering now, I think it might have been Antonio Margariti, so I wonder if he was saying it as a reference to... Because, you know, Tarantino loves movies like this. So Yeah, yeah. He probably uh, he listens to this show, doesn't he? He probably does, yeah. Well, you would think that being such an egotist, though. I would. But why do I do it, Tom? <laughs> why do I do it? You can imagine old Tarantino sitting there whacking off to pictures of feet. Yeah. Because, you know, that's that's what he likes. 
<laughs> um, I'm not just making that up, folks. That's a real thing. He really does have a foot fetish. Uh, the Last Hunter son. Uh, t- uh, son? <laughs> yeah. I called you son there. Yes, the, last hun- <laughs> the Last Hunter, my boy. Uh, was, yeah, directed by Antonio Margheriti. Uh, it was written by... Now, I'm going to try and pronounce this surname. It's complicated. It is. It was uh, written by Gianfranco... I think it's Kuyu Dejan. Dejan. I think the M is silence. Kudu Dejan. The GN, Kuyu, written by Gianfranco Kuyu and Dardano Sacchetti. Now, let me read you the synopsis of this one. So, American soldier Henry, played by David Warbeck, is hanging out in Saigon at a strip joint, cooling off with a drink as his best friend Steve lays with a caressing woman. Steve's clearly been hugely affected by the ongoing Vietnam War, and he cries out for his lover Carol, who isn't there. He becomes angrier by the minute at the woman, offering to give him a good night, and takes her anger out on an investigating soldier, shooting him in the head and killing him instantly. Henry leaps to his aid, trying to calm him down, but Steve has had enough. He turns the gun on himself, just as bombs begin hitting the area, and the strip joint itself, and he pulls the trigger. Only Henry manages to escape from the place, as the bombs blow it to pieces. We flash forward and Henry has been given a secret assignment. He's to be dropped off in the midst of the war to accomplish a mission, though he won't yet reveal what it is. The helicopters, though, under fire, drop him into an open lake and he crawls out to be met by some of the other American soldiers tasked to help him, one of whom is played by Bobby Rhodes, star of many Italian genre films. I'm sure we'll get to that, Tom. Uh, Also along for the ride is war photographer Jane, played by T. Safaro, who is there to snap pictures of the events as they unfold. Their journey towards Henry's still secretive goal brings them to a military base ran by a pissed off lieutenant where the soldiers within spend much of their time eyeing up Jane with a plan to corner and rape her. They try to do so and are stopped by the lieutenant who, as punishment, rather odd punishment, sends one of the soldiers off in, out into the uh, line of fire to retrieve a coconut and bring it back and he does so. Henry speaks with the lieutenant who feels that the base is quite secure from the Vietnamese soldiers who have been attacking it. However, things go very awry when it transpires that the Vietnamese soldiers have been digging a tunnel into the base. They break on through and kill almost everyone in the base, aside from Henry and his soldiers who escape, and Jane, who is captured and taken back to the Vietnamese base. Henry's plan is soon revealed. He's been tasked with taking out the American woman who has been transmitting anti-war propaganda on the radio waves. Unfortunately for Henry, the Vietnamese soldiers are watching, and as his allies dwindle in number, he'll find himself captured, and he'll be forced to fight for survival alongside Jane, as the soldiers seek to discover his plans. And just who is this mysterious American woman telling the American soldiers to return home? Well, an interesting twist lies ahead. Tell me about this assignment. I'm sorry, I'm not authorized to tell. Bullshit. Even Charlie knows you have a mission behind their lines. So what the fuck is it they've set you up to get yourself killed for? I asked for it. Saigano's getting dull. Double bullshit. Saigano's Asia's biggest beaver colony. You can't be dull. Come on. Give it to us. You're really gonna let some shithead tell you... Excuse me. I don't mean to interrupt, but... You already have. Major William Cash. Jane Foster, United Wire Services. Major, I'd like to talk to you about your men. My boys have not seen a woman in a long while, Miss Foster. If they're a bit raunchy, it's understandable. Things are pretty tough here. So you've got to learn to do things the way we do without making too much fuss. Now, why don't you sit down? We're losing this goddamn war. Like a regular bunch of shitheads. A handful of yellow gooks have got us pinned down in a cave like rats while our government's got enough military might to wipe the face off half the world. Thank you. With a tin pot radio, Charlie keeps gnawing away at the morale of my boys. Their propaganda is doing more damage than all our napalm. <laughs> Pay no attention to it. By the time they get up here, they're spent. About as much a pain in the ass as a bee sting. What the fuck is going on? So, Tom, here we have a film that, uh, as I said, I think could be more accurately placed into the war film category. What did you think of The Last Hunter? I think when I started watching this, I was expecting something extremely trashy and exploitative and, you know, all those all those things we love. And 
it does have those things to a degree but it's also much better than i thought it would be i i think it it's a well shot movie you know the story isn't going to blow anyone away there are aspects to that we'll talk about as we go on but it's a, it's a, it's a strange one really it's it's a bit of a romp in some ways and i think we've got david warbeck in the middle and we'll we'll talk about him more a bit later on but whenever i watch david warbeck he always puts me in a certain mood and I, and i think people who don't know him from a lot of stuff might watch this and think what are you talking about because i i think once you've seen a few of his movies you carry uh, his personality with you to a degree because he he just brings out a sort of boyish glee in me whenever i watch him in something um so it's it's a romp it's fun at times it's got some really good looking gore in it but it's not overdone I just really enjoyed this movie, you know. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's amazing, but I, I think it was just really, really pretty good. Well, I mean, first of all, on, on the, the subject of David Warbeck, uh, he's got presence, hasn't he? Mm. I really think he does. And, of course, he was in one of our fa- jointly one of our favourite movies, The Beyond, yeah. from 1981, which is a movie that I love to pieces, and I think he's very good in it. Uh, we'll go back to him a bit later, but just as a sort of a, an overview of how I felt about the movie, there's going to be a bit of a divide between us here, Tom. <laughs> uh, now, I don't think there's anything particularly bad about it, really. I think, like you say, all, all the good things you've said about it are there. You know, it's shot well, and uh, it's, you know, there's some good violence in there. I think some some decent characters, not terribly memorable or anything like that, but... No. Uh, but, you know, it's a, a, a perfectly sort of serviceable war story that covers a different angle of the Vietnam War. Um, I just was utterly bored by it. Really? Yeah, I just really struggled to get through it. And uh, there were moments where it's like, OK, all right, get, pull yourself together, Chris. Come on, come on. And then it would sort of perk up a little bit because there were, you know, these action scenes happening and things like that. And, uh, and, you know, again, I'm sitting there thinking, this is very, you know, this is decent and sort of quite capable, really. And, and you know, there, there's nothing I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, that was a bit terrible, wasn't it? A few bits here and there. They were like, oh, OK, the, the, this film's got the rapiest soldiers in it I've ever seen in my life, you know, mm. um, which we'll get to as we move through the story. But, you know, and a bit stereotypical in that way. But I just, I really was, I just was falling asleep through it. I just was not captivating me at all. And uh, yeah, I, I I really it struggled to to leave an impression on me. I have to say, you know, I I don't think I'm that enamoured with it. Where I would sit here and say, "What? You know, what are you talking about?" You know, mm-hmm. and when I say it's good, I think it's good. Like I think I was just expecting it to be utter trash, and was quite pleasantly surprised at how good it was. And I don't know, it just, it, it has pacing issues here and there, but it, it ticked along at a, quite a nice um, pace for me. You know, it's it's funny, I think these days when people make war movies, the, the actors will go to boot camp and, you know, prepare and stuff like that, so they have some element of authenticity about them. None of these have that element of authenticity about them. When they fire their machine guns, they just sort of wave them round like and, and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean the the one guy who you know picks up a couple of injuries throughout the movie. I mean when he fires his gun, he, he's waving it all over the place. You know, I mean that is not military training. You know, not very good at aim. I mean, let let's start with the bar scene, I guess, and then we'll start to get into things as we go along. I I thought it was a kind of nice off kilter the way it was shot. I almost felt like I was drunk with the way they filmed it. Um, yeah. And you know, this guy is obviously very much affected by the war, and he ends up shooting himself in the head and stuff like that. But it brought me into a certain atmosphere, which. I quite liked, you know, and and it made me kind of sit up and take notice. Like, oh, hold on, you know, yeah, it's it's a it's trashy, which is fine, but he's a, he's able to build a bit of genuine sort of atmosphere around this thing. 
Yeah, I mean, this is the one scene that you can say is very comparable to The Deer Hunter. Um, this was an obvious influence. Now, I have to say, I'm sure some people will just lose their minds and never listen to me again uh, when I say that I'm not a big fan of The Deer Hunter either. Um, I was quite bored by that as well. <laughs> so, uh, you know, which is one of those movies that everybody tells you is really great. And there are aspects of it where I'm like, undoubtedly, this is great filmmaking, but it just did it didn't work for me particularly but uh but this is the scene in the movie where it's like okay the the sort of after effects of war and ptsd mm. and clearly this guy i think his name was steve yeah um is suffering from that and is having flashbacks and delusions and things like that and we get some some real violence some impactful violence at the beginning here where there's this bit of a prick this soldier who's walking around he starts teasing steve kind of winds him up a bit and steve ends up shooting him in the head and it's quite a brutal scene you know uh, and then, you know, uh, David Warbeck, who plays, what was his name now? Uh, Henry. Uh, he sort of comes in and tries to calm Steve down, and there's, you know, it's a very seedy sort of place, and then the bombs start dropping, and, and Steve takes his own life. And I think that that part of it I, I, I quite enjoyed. Uh, so then we move on from there, and we get, you know, Henry being dropped down in there. It's funny, this is a very Italian war movie. Mm. I think there are certain things, aren't there, where you can just sort of tell that this is Italian filmmaking. I think, you know, if it were it not for for the story going one way, it could almost be a cannibal movie with a bunch of, yeah. you know, guys being dropped into the, uh, you know, dropped into the jungle, <laughs> and they're, you know, I was half expecting because even a there's even a scene where one of the soldiers gets killed by a trap, and it it reminded me a bit of a scene in one of the very first cannibal movies we reviewed uh, maybe yeah, in the first yeah. cannibal do you remember cannibal yeah yeah mm. whether one of the guys in there one, i think a guide or something like that gets killed by a by a trap um but yeah it, it and at this point I'm, I'm quite interested you know even though you know henry dro drops in he's in the water he gives up his gun and all of his ammo and his supplies because there's a snake there um i'm not sure why he couldn't have just pulled them away and buggered off very quickly but he decides to leave all his weapons there. and luckily is uh, found by one of the the soldiers there. One of the soldiers is played by Bobby Rhodes. Yes, the bald guy there. Now we know Bobby Rhodes well, don't we, Tom? Not personally, but have you interviewed Bobby Rhodes? I haven't. I haven't. I've heard interviews with him. He speaks very differently from um, from how he's dubbed in in all these movies. Oh, is he really? I t I didn't know that. Uh, I always thought he would. I always thought he did his own dubbing. Perhaps he didn't. Well, maybe he does and puts on a a, a voice, but his natural speaking voice is very different. Yeah, because of course this is an Italian movie. At this point, at this period of time, in Italy, they were not shooting with sync sound, which means that any of these Italian movies that you see were had to be dubbed over later because they weren't shooting with sound on the set. Um, so everybody here is overdubbed, um, which is one thing I, I remember explaining that to an old friend once. I was like, they were saying, well, it doesn't quite match up, does it? Like, it sounds like they've been overdubbed. And I was like, well, yeah, that they weren't shooting with sync sound at this point. It sort of adds to the charm, I find, with a lot of these movies at that time, the Italian stuff, you know, yeah. especially as a lot of the act some of the actors in some of the films you'd have like English actors with Italian actors and stuff yes. like that. And they weren't necessarily speaking the same language and it'd be all, but I, I think it forms a part of the atmosphere of the whole thing that gives it its own feeling, which I really like. I agree. Just the idea that, I mean, Fulci was very much that way. He, mm. you know, he would just say, well, look, just speak in whatever language you speak. <laughs> I'll put it all together at the end, you know? Uh, so yeah, just to say Bobby Rhodes is in two of my favourite movies, which is Demons and Demons 2. Of course. In my opinion, classic Italian films that were recently covered by the Ancient Slumber podcast, old Chris Ward and Myron. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely check that out if you want to hear their, their thoughts on, on those films. Uh, so, so here we are, Tom. We're going on this journey now. They're sort of making their way through the jungle here. They're heading towards this military base. Now, at this point, what is it about this that's sort of captivated you? I don't think there's anything that particular particularly captivates me i think it's just an enjoyable romp you know there's a bit of blood here and there you know the, the parachutist with the the re and i think the effects are really good in it as well um mm -hmm. i don't know it's just got an enjoyable level of violence to it and stuff like that you know it's not excessive um i don't know really yeah see i thought it had a lot of pacing issues i thought it was there was just a lot of pissing about really you know i i uh, maybe because I, I didn't sort of fully, I wasn't fully behind a lot of these characters. I found Henry to be 
uh, through, even though you know, as much as I love David Warbeck and I do, I, I found him to be a bit of a prick really through some of it. <laughs> you know, the reaction he has to, like I say, these are some of the rapiest soldiers next to the ones in Twenty Eight Days Later, mm. um, if you remember them. Uh, where, which is a great point actually in in that particular movie that the military are probably worse than the, than the uh, the infected are, and uh, and so we get the you know these soldiers eyeing up Jane, making lewd comments, you know, grabbing her, just these you know horrible things and. And they attempt to rape her, and luckily that doesn't happen. But then she goes and tells Henry about it. Couldn't give a shit. No. Just could not care less. Is in his own world, and and perhaps is jaded by what he's had to go through. There are points, you know, like when the the Vietnamese soldiers are attacking the the military base, and they've they've you know scraped through the tunnel and they're killing everybody. That sort of perks up for me. I quite enjoyed that, and you know the like you say the the effects are quite good. Mm. You know the uh, the lieutenant there who gets killed with the machete through the neck. Yeah, you know, very good effect there, but it just—I oh, I just struggled, Tom. You know, I—I I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's—it's it's, it's just one of those things that we always go on instinct and feeling, and this is one where I just my body was instinctually telling me, "You don't." It's not doing it for you, Chris. You know, and it—and it's not one of those things where I'm like, "Oh God, this film's so terrible. I can't stand it." Far from it. I think it's quite competent, but it just was not. It just was not captivating me. And I was not connecting with it really. There. You know, uh, but I, there are moments, certainly there are moments where I mean, I was more entertained by Aftermath, even though that's got and it seems like maybe we're on the opposite ends of that, where I think you were you were more bored by Aftermath than mm. I was. There was never really a moment in here that rivaled the shootout at the end of Aftermath, um, where it just sort of perked up and got really silly and ridiculous. And, and I enjoyed it. There are ridiculous moments that, to give an example, they they Henry and. Uh, the Bobby Rose character and the the other guy who who's been shot in the uh, in the side, they decide for some reason to take over a boat. Mm. Yeah, they're trying to they're trying to hide out from from Vietnamese soldiers, so they decide it, the best plan is to put ourselves in a an open target where we can be attacked from either side. It's a very good tactic, Tom. If you think about it. <laughs> where we can be attacked by either side in plain view. <laughs> and, you know, Henry rides on the boat for a bit and then decides to go off and complete his mission, which at this point we know is he has to take out this this uh, person who's transmitting over the radio waves this sort of anti-war propaganda. And he leaves this guy on the boat with some guns and some cigarettes. Yeah. And this guy decides, for whatever reason, uh, not only is he a massive target, who can be attacked from from any, from either side? He decides to sing really loudly to ensure that his position is discovered very quickly, and um, it's a bit sad, really, because I sort of didn't mind that character, and they just let him die a really dishonourable death, where he just burns to death screaming. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I think the, he knew he was dead at that point. You know what I mean? It, it, I think when David Warbeck left him, um, or Henry left him, he. He knew he was dead, but yeah, there's there's no point in drawing attention to yourself by singing really loudly. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, I think a major weakness of the film is the main plot is that Warbeck was tasked with going to destroy a radio antenna or something that was uh, broadcasting this. Uh, these messages to American troops that they would listen to on the radio. Now, these messages were were kind of very demor- demoralizing for the troops. Uh, you know, trying to convince them to leave the war, disobey orders, go home, that kind of thing. And it was from a female with an American accent. Um, and his mission was to go and root out the the source of that and destroy it or whatever. Now. The thing is, what they played on that radio is nothing you would ever sit and listen to. You know, it was like, yeah. go home, American soldier. Go home to your girl. You know, disobey orders. Your job is to go home now. You know what I mean? And it was like, you wouldn't listen to that for more than 30 seconds. Now, if it was some kind of, uh, you know, truth-talking um personality on that radio you know and um, we we see this on films all the time and i think malcolm in the middle sort of lampooned it you know mm-hmm. someone who goes on the radio and speaks the truth you know sticks it to the man and tells you how it really is kind of thing and i think if it was that 
sort of personality on the radio, someone saying, listen, this war's a load of bullshit, you need to go home, blah, 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 and, you know, really digging at people's reasons for being there, it would have felt like more of a an actual reason to try and get rid of them. But as it is, it's just like a woman saying, go home, American soldier, go home. Yeah. And it, it was a bit weak as a central kind of plot. Do you know who would have been better, Tom? Go on. Newman. If they'd got New, if they got Newman, if they got New, no, hear me out. If they got Newman on there, and he just came on there, and he didn't mess about, mm. and he just said, "Listen, lads, go home. I've got this," and you'd know, because he's very, because that's what Newman does. He can take out a whole base of people on his own. Exactly, and they so would have went needed any soldier. He would have won the Vietnam War, Tom, by himself. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, though, isn't it? It is, but we can still do it, Tom. We can still make that film. We need to track Steve Barquette down and say, look, forget the event. The, the events of Aftermath were a dream. Hmm. We make The Last Hunter 2. I know that's a weird title because <laughs> The Last Hunter would suggest The Last Hunter, but he's The Last Last Hunter. Call it The Last Last Hunter. And he comes in and he's like, look, lads, go home. Send all- he, he rings the president at the beginning of the movie, Tom. Hmm. And he says, look, Prez... Newman, and and the press goes out. Oh, Newman. Hi, Newman. Hi, hi Newman. Yeah, because he knows straight away. Yeah, he's got two people on the line, Tom. He's got Jack Bauer and Newman on there. He drops Jack Bauer. He says, "Jack, shit off." I've got Newman on the line, and he speaks to Newman. He says, uh, "Newman says, look, press, bring them all back home. I've got this." <sighs> that would have been a, that would have been a better movie. Why didn't they do that, Tom? They you know what? Fuck, you, f- fuck this movie. I. Shit. <laughs> You're right with his moustache bristling against the uh, the microphone <laughs> as he talks. But uh, sorry, Tom, I let my extensively, hugely large ego get in the way there. Have you discussing a very pertinent point about this movie? Please continue. Well, to be fair, it was probably quite boring, and no one would understand it because I mumble so much. But, um, but yeah, yeah, to be honest, that that's all I had to say about it. Really, it was just you know considering that was his mission. It didn't seem like much of a mission for what was coming out of that radio because if you listen to that for two minutes, you'd want to turn it off anyway. Yeah, and I, I can't imagine that there would be many self-respecting soldiers who would listen to that and think, you know what, this boringly voiced woman is right. <laughs> I'm going to leave and go back home and become a deserter, by the way, which is uh, not something you really want to do when you're in the military, to be honest with you. It's not, it's not held in high regard, Tom. Uh, so... You know, Henry is a very fortuitous man because he eventually gets kidnapped along with, like, like we said in the, the synopsis, gets kidnapped by the Vietnamese soldiers, soldiers, is thrown down into a little watery pit there with rats in it. And there's a guy down there who, again, it's pretty good effect, this guy whose eye, eye, eye has been chewed out and his face has kind of been chewed off and he, he you know, drowns, dies. Mm-hmm. The rats are feeding on him. You can imagine it'd be quite a torturous death down there. Yeah. This uh, g- guy who's in charge there, this Vietnamese guy, he comes in, questions him, you know, what is your mission, throws him back into the pit. And then, Tom, something wonderful happens, a miracle. Mm. Everybody who is at the base, they all decide to leave in one go uh, at exactly the same time and leave the base totally empty so that the two Americans can escape. And I think that was very nice of them to well, have done yeah. that. You know, I thought that they were, they obviously felt pity for him. You thought, you know what, guys, let's get out of here and let's let this boy, let's let this boy go. He deserves it. You know, we won't get, we won't put him out ourselves. We'll just all leave at exactly the same time. Well, maybe Newman was involved. Maybe Newman had turned up. We just don't see him. And they see Newman and they think, fuck, we're out of here. Tom, I like, oh, I like, Mm. I like, you're pushing my button, Tom, and it's responding. (laughs) It's responding. Imagine that if the sequel was Newman had drawn them all away. Yeah. Right? That'd be, look, I I know I'm taking the piss out of this movie, (laughs) and I'm taking the piss out of it as if I, as if I, um, you know, I thought it was bad or anything like that, and I didn't at all. I just, uh, no, it just never got me, really. Just never captured me. I was sort of like, oh, you know, twiddling my thumb, like, oh, when's this going to be over? And I don't know why it did that. Maybe it just didn't appeal to me personally, but I thought it had a had a lot of a pacing issues. We, we get a, a twist at the end, though, Tom. And you were saying, really, you know, the mission itself and this woman, it, it doesn't seem like a very solid goal. I get the feeling the reason they did it was 
for the final twist to be the revelation of who this woman actually was. Yeah. Um, it was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Thatcher is in there, Tom, uh, with her, her big do. Mm -hmm. And she shakes her do at him and she says, old boy, it was me all along. Because that's the way Margaret Thatcher used to talk, of course, if you remember. She would, when she was a politician, she would say, old boy. Anyway, uh, you carry on now. <laughs> so, basically... Uh, everyone clears out. Warbeck's down with the, the girl. Was her name Sarah or something? Or Carol? I can't uh, Carol. Remember. Yeah, yeah. So Carol. you find that's what you find out that it was actually Steve, Steve, uh, his best friend Steve, who killed himself at the beginning of the movie. He was, you know, great friends with him, great friends with Carol, and it turns out that Carol is actually the one who, you know, had joined the other team basically, and that's had, right. uh, been feeding this information across the airwaves and everything. So. The, the reporter woman comes in while after Warbeck uh, confronts Carol. Carol gets killed by Warbeck and they go out. And then I don't understand why Henry stays behind. No, it, I didn't was, understand that either. Was there something I missed? <laughs> because no. he just sort of stays there in the mud, rips his dog's, dog tags off and lets, her, and lets uh, the reporter woman fly away with the helicopters. I mean, it, it could be a very powerful end, and if there's a reason for it, you know, mm. he sacrifices himself for some reason, but I just didn't get why he did. I mean, I guess we're sort of meant to infer, really, that perhaps he was just so sort of traumatised by the things he'd seen yeah. that he felt he could, you know, he couldn't function in normal society anymore. Perhaps it was that. Uh, but yeah, we get no explanation for that. He just sort of stays behind, and then, you know, you see the bombs drop, and you know that he's... You know, he's a, he's a goner, really. And it was a, a strange thing. It, surprising, though, I have to say. Again, I suppose a bit like the ending of Aftermath. You know, I never expected uh, you know Newman to die because mm. he's Newman. And I didn't expect this guy to, to die either. I thought he would get on the helicopter and it would be quite predictable in that way. I mean, at the beginning of the movie, as soon as the character of Jane came along, I was like, OK, I already know what's going to happen here. Uh, everybody's going to die in this movie <laughs> except for Henry and Jane and they're going to get away. And uh, thinking about that, that Henry and Jane Fonda, Henry Fonda, Jane Fonda. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, strange ending, and and no real sort of. Again, you're meant to infer that it was it was possibly his choice to remain behind where you know many of his brothers fell, perhaps you know. But we're just sort of making that up, really. Maybe, maybe. But we we've touched upon David Warbeck, but um, I think people who might listen to this who aren't that familiar with more of his films might might watch this and think well what what's the fuss about and and i don't think it's one of his most charismatic of performances but he, he's always got some charisma david warbeck um and i think like i said earlier if you know his other stuff you kind of carry that with you um to a degree but i i just like watching him i just like him on screen you know um mm -hmm. Alan Jones on the, the extras to the Video Nasties documentary talks about him and with a lot of fondness and a bit of sadness because unfortunately he's passed away now about, you know, he at this time was doing all these Italian films and just loving life and the opportunity that these films gave him, you know, he party. Alan Jones said, yeah, you know, I remember going to orgies at his house and stuff like that. <laughs> he just, you know... There was um, is it Ian McCulloch from Zombie Flesh Eaters? Yes. You know he went over and done a couple, but he was sort of like a different character. And I interviewed him once, and he said, you know, he done those, he done like two or three films in Italy, and then he left. And David Warbeck started to do the films that he probably would have done. Yeah, because they're totally different characters. Um, Ian McCulloch's a bit more stiff upper lip British, you know, very straight lace. Whereas Warbeck was kind of like, okay, I'm going to go out to Italy and all these places they're going to send me. They're going to pay me money to be the lead in these films, and I'm just going to go out and enjoy it. And that's what I love about him, you know. And if you've ever listened to the commentary on the Beyond, he's he's just a funny, really good guy. I never have done that actually. So now you're making me want to do that. I, I really like watching him too. I couldn't agree with you more, you know. And but there's a, got a little bit of trivia about him. Some perhaps a piece and piece of trivia there that some of you may find quite surprising. But uh, but yeah, a very watchable guy and, and good charisma there. 
Uh, he's not the problem for me in this one. The problem for me is that I just found that it was, you know, I, perhaps I have a reputation for disliking everything. I don't think I do, but uh, I think we've liked more movies on this movie than we've disliked, really. I'm not sure about that. But uh, mm. but th this is one where I just, I don't dislike it. I don't even know if I dislike it. You know, I just was bored by it, really. And, mm. uh, you know, I think you can be bored by a movie and yet see the good things that are in it, but it's just perhaps not for you, and this was one of those for me. You know, like I said, I'm not a, a huge fan of war movies, uh, but I like some of them, and it just depends on what appeals to me, really, you know. And uh, this is one that, like you said at the very beginning, you, you really enjoyed it. And uh, for me, I, I sort of didn't, really. I was kind of looking at the clock all the time. But there's no doubt that David Warbeck is a good presence here. And, um, you know, deserves some of the acclaim that he had. You know, certainly I don't blame him at all for, for sort of taking advantage of that great Italian scene that was going on at the time there. Mm. And although they were ripping off a lot of very popular films, you know, he was earning money doing it. And, uh, you know, perhaps having opportunities that he wouldn't have had elsewhere. So it's, um, so yeah, but it, it just, I don't know, The Last Hunter, it didn't quite, didn't quite get there for me really, Tom, in, in the way that I think it did for you. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a great movie, but I thought it was a decent romp, better than I expected. And, you know, maybe some time down the line, I'll, I'll give it another watch because sometimes things just settle in with you and you, and you kind of... Uh, start to like him a bit more, but you know, I would, I would never kind of say I can't see where you're coming from because I could see how it might be that way for people. But for me, it it just worked a bit better. Yeah, well, that's good to know. I have to say that uh, it's interesting because the director of this, Antonio Margaretti, uh, said that he had set out, unlike the director of the Deer Hunter, whose name I've completely forgotten now, uh, he set out to make a, a, a film that was set in Vietnam that was fun. Hmm. Uh, sort of implying that because the deer hunter's got a lot of you know got a lot of anti-war sentiments to it it's a reflection on the vietnam war uh and is you know done quite well in in that way my favorite part of the deer hunter is when they're in vietnam and it's a lot of the other stuff around it that i found sort of quite superfluous and dull uh but the stuff in vietnam i, I really enjoyed and but i think there's quite a lot of anti-war propaganda in this like you know the the transmissions on the radio themselves and then the final song at the end is basically a guy saying, "God, isn't war terrible?" Which it is. Which it is. But the the whole thing is like, so what? You claiming that you didn't put any of that in there? Because I think that's probably the most obvious. That's more. That song is more obvious than anything the uh, the deer hunter guy did. Um, you know, the, oh God, war's horrible. Why must we do it? You know. So I was quite sort of interested in that. Really, the the idea of it being more fun. I didn't think it was a particularly fun movie. You know, I thought it was. It had harrowing bits in it, and you know, for me anyway, it's boring bits really. So I'm not sure if he, uh, for me anyway, he accomplished what he what he set out to do with that. Okay, well, I've nothing really more to say on it. So how about we get to my favourite part of any film discussion, the trivia. Okay, well, let's do some trivia then, Tom. <laughs> uh, now, lead star David Warbeck, who originally hailed from New Zealand, became something of an icon in Italy, of course, as, as Tom was saying, thanks to his work on films like Lucio Fulci's The Beyond in 1981 and The Black Cat, the very same year. I think The Black Cat has just been re-released by Arrow Video mm -hmm. uh, in a Blu-ray box set, along with a, another film that I can't remember the name of. Uh, uh, but it's like a, it's like a, a double... Um, well, it's Double another feature. it's another version of the Black Cat, isn't it? I'm not sure whether it's called the same thing though. But um, I think it's I think it's got a different title, but I can't. Yeah, maybe yeah. A, a riff on the same story. But I actually mm. really like Fulci's The Black Cat. I think it's a bit um, overshadowed, maybe by zombie stuff. But I think it's pretty decent. Yeah, you know, I've not seen it, so mm. uh, that's one I, I I do want to pick that up. Some it's just a bit bit pricey for me at the moment. Uh, Warbeck did a number of films with this film's director, uh, Antonio Margaretti, many of which were inspired by or were rip-offs of popular mainstream releases. The Last Hunter was intended to be Margaretti's answer to The Deer Hunter, of course, and he also made two films that copied Indiana Jones, with Warbeck in the starring role, Hunters of the Golden Cobra in 1982 and Ark of the Sun God in 1983. Uh, now here's oh, wow. the thing that some of you may not know, unless you're a big fan of Warbeck. Uh, interestingly, Warbeck was supposedly lined up to play Bond, Mr. James Bond, before Roger Moore got the role. He was paid money to remain a substitute and backup for many years and was surprised to uh, learn that Timothy Dalton got the role after Moore, at which point Warbeck was considered by producers to be too old to play the role. Uh, Warbeck sadly passed away in 1997 from cancer. Uh, Tom, you and I are big Bond fans. Uh, mm -hmm. Astonishing. Imagine that. David Warbeck as Bond. 
I, I can see him as a Bond in the in the Roger Moore mould. Yeah, I, I can kind of yeah. see that to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Actually, it would be quite interesting. Really, I like. I happen to like Timothy Dalton um, as Bond as well, and mm. uh, I think that was a very good choice. But imagine that, eh? David Warbeck, how different his career might have been yeah. in terms of Hollywood success if he'd, if he'd gotten that. Uh, director Antonio Magaretti had a long career making exploitation movies, several of which are considered cult classics. His film *Your the Hunter from the Future* is considered such a film, alongside *Flesh for Frankenstein*, which he had some involvement with. Didn't have enough time to really research how how much he was involved with that, whether he was just a name that was slung onto it or whether he actually did direct it. Uh, I have to say, uh, one of my favourite podcasts, Junk Food Cinema, which is done by two critics from uh, in Austin, um, covered uh, Your, The Hunter from the Future. They covered a whole load of post-apocalyptic movies and um, really, really good. I suggest you seeking that out if you want to hear a bit more about that movie. Um uh, so back to this director. He directed many of his films under the name Anthony M. Dawson and made his last film in 1997. He succumbed to a heart attack and passed away in 2002, sadly. Uh, oh, my voice went a bit squeaky at the end there, sadly. Uh, and finally, Tisa Farrow, who plays photographer Jane here, is also no stranger to Lucio Fulci. She played the female lead in Fulci's Zombie Flesh Eaters, another one of our favourites, Tom. Uh, also known as Zombie and a Zombie 2 in Italy, which was released in 1979. She's the sister of Mia Farrow, so came from a... Uh, very successful family, but didn't really have a ton of success. I mean, she, she sort of started in a bunch of genre stuff towards the end. She was in Zombie Flesh Eaters. She was in uh, Anthropophagus the Beast, which I think was the last film she made in 1980. And then she uh, apparently stopped acting in order to become a nurse. Oh, so, nice. okay. There you go. And uh, unlike her sister, who, of course, carried on becoming hugely successful. So uh, if you want to find this film, it can be found quite easily on DVD, released by Vipco. Good old Vipco, Tom. Good old Vipco. Uh, the, Infamous Vipco, known very well, I think, to Video Nasty's enthusiasts. Uh, the cover of the DVD states that it's the uncut version. A DVD release was also available in the US from Dark Sky Films, who tend to put out good stuff. Uh, seems to be fetching a higher price now if you want to import it. I just looked on Amazon a while back. I think it's about £20 or something like that in order to get it. Um, how did you find yours, Tom? It was a funny one, you know, because I remember looking for it a while ago and it was... You know, you'd see it on the second-hand sales on Amazon and stuff for about three quid or whatever. And then when I went to actually buy it, it suddenly jumped up in price um, to like 10, 20 pounds or more. Um, mm. So it was maybe people had heard it was going to be on the Strange and Deadly show and that, you know, obviously that raises the value of a film. Absolutely. So, um, but luckily... <laughs> I found a copy on eBay for three quid. <laughs> That's not bad at all, then. Mm. So, do you know what what version it is? It's from it, a specific label, or it's a, it's the Vipco one. Which, to be fair, look, you know, it's fine. It looks okay. Which is rare for Vipco because, <laughs> although they were you know very enthusiastic about getting films out uncut, sometimes they were they did not they were not an Arrow video. They did not care about uh, picture quality <laughs> very much at all. <laughs> so. There's that. Uh, so that's it, guys. You know, that's the end of the review section. I think, you know, two films that have s similarities somewhat. Uh, one really more of a post-apocalyptic kind of thing. That's Aftermath, of course, and The Last Hunter. Uh, yeah, sort of differing opinions there somewhat, Tom. Are you, do, would you rewatch uh, The Last Hunter? Uh, I would, you know, not soon. Maybe give it a year or so. But um, possibly, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you this. Would you take this movie was ninety five minutes long? Would you take ninety five minutes out of your Fallout Four time to watch this movie again? Absolutely not. There we go. So now, folks, with that said, the review section over and done with. I think it's time for us to get into some feedback. Let's have a listen to some feedback from not Gore Boy, because that's a silly name, but Gore Blimey. Oh, he's back again, is he? Well, all right then. Hi guys, Gore Blimey here. That's Gore Blimey, not Gore Boy, on Twitter as at Double Agent Seventy Three. I had a chance to watch Aftermath and thought I'd talk about it by dividing the film into three half-hour sections, and here are the notes I made. 
So for the first 30 minutes, I'm right behind this. Visually, it looks interesting. It's got Argento-style primary coloured lights, good use of lighting and darkness, and the music's provided by a full-blown orchestra. Though that does seem a bit excessive, and it feels like you're watching a silent movie at times. There's something about the way it's directed and acted that feels like you're watching one of those Saturday tea time TV shows from the late 70s, like Space 1999 or The Incredible Hulk, until someone gets their head splattered by a shotgun. Yes, we get some surprisingly gory effects near the very beginning of this. There's a narration over lots of the scenes, which is a bit naff and reminds me of the barbaric beast of Boggy Creek Part 2. The backgrounds and sets are quite good, and the map painting of the destroyed city is actually pretty effective, especially when it's intercut with filming locations of ruined buildings. Like I said, I was really enjoying myself with this. On to the middle section, and the camera work, which has been OK till now, is starting to get a bit shaky. The moon has started to jiggle around slightly behind the clouds, as if they're on a glass slide being held in front of the camera. There's still some interesting use of light and dark, like in the museum scenes, and the music never seems to take a break, and is so overblown it's starting to make me laugh. And the naff factor is upped by the misty soft focus happy family dream sequence we get. On to the final 30 minutes. The music is not funny anymore. In fact, it's giving me a headache. By now, things are taking so long for anything to happen, it's starting to annoy me. Lots of lengthy scenes of the man walking around, slowly looking at things, don't help. And there's a distinct lack of the gore that was promised at the beginning of the film. Generally, the special effects are much less special. I mean, using miniature models with flames coming out of them? Flames that can't be scaled down? Oh dear. There's a western-style shootout at the end, which should be the dramatic climax of the film, but the different shots suggest it was filmed at different times of the day using one camera again and edited together afterwards. It goes on far too long, it becomes tedious, and by now I'm genuinely considering turning the sound off. The music is seriously doing my head in. The second astronaut um, he rescued earlier reappears from somewhere or other, I know I'd forgotten about him too. And the man says, why did you come? His friend says, I just did. I don't think that was quite what he was asking, but he obviously felt the experience was a lot more stimulating than I did. The chief baddie doesn't get anywhere near enough time on screen. There's far too much of the main character walking around and not doing a lot, while the narration drones on, presumably to make it feel like the story is moving on faster than it actually is. And another thing, and this is a bit of a spoiler, the voiceover confuses me anyway. Is he talking to us from beyond the grave or, or what? I really thought I was going to enjoy this, especially watching the first 30 minutes, but blimey, the rest of it seems to go on for hours. Well, hope you enjoyed it more than I did. That's all from me, and speak to you soon. Okay, so he talks about Aftermath because he didn't check out The Last Hunter, but he said he was with the film for the first 30 minutes or so, enjoyed the Argento-esque colour scheme, and um, yeah, I can see where he's coming from there. I think I said something similar, you know, the first third, it seems to be all going on, and then that's where the pacing issues start to come in a bit, isn't it? Yeah, I can understand that. You know, I had sort of similar issues when he's in that museum and uh, but the color scheme in there interesting, and they do some interesting things, and I can definitely understand where, where he's at, where he got the Argento thing from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, some 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 touches of that in there, which you got to hand it to Barquette. You know, not you know we didn't really mention the sort of cinema cinematography and everything. It's not bad, is it really? You know, it's serviceable, a bit bland you could say, but um, yeah, not that bad. But then he says there that the um, now you sort of <laughs> you kind of hinted towards this as well that the music starts to make him laugh due to how sort of ceaselessly bombastic it is uh, because you know 
it'll just be sort of Barkett running around a bit. And it's like dong 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 <laughs> it will do this. Sorry, Tom, I got very carried away there. Yeah. Um, I apologise to all. I must be insufferable this episode for a lot of you. I apologise. Um, I'm hyped up on uh, uh, coffee. That's my excuse. Um, well, that I have had coffee today, so that explains it. Um, but yeah, he. Um, <laughs> I quite like the soundtrack in it, but it, it is right that it does, you know, it's over the top, isn't it? Yeah. Um, begins to get really bored an hour in and i think this is where you you and you and he sort of converge really uh, with newman sort of walking around and, and and looking at things a lot mm. and also he points out that there's a lack of gore effects after the ones early on that execution scene there's really not any sort of any real graphic gore after that is there yeah and uh how anyone can get that offended by this uh, well i guess there's a bit of rapiness in it and uh a lot of gunplay so maybe that was what it got it on the list but it's it's quite tame really yeah we, we sort of now and again we touch on that don't we that how on earth can this film be on there and this is one of those where it's like well maybe it got on there for these sort of exploding heads kind of thing mm. but um other than that no it's sort of fairly tame isn't it um he felt that the final shootout went on too long that was my favorite part because <laughs> uh, it's so sort of long but he sort of says there that it felt like different shots were filmed on different days but that's very likely the case you know the man was um you know working with a very very small amount of money so i can imagine he um you know he had to sort of shoot things on different days and um, he picks up on the line that, that i mentioned there why did you come that newman asked matthews who replies i just did he found that funny the reason he found that funny tom is because he said why did you come and gore blimey he likes all that doesn't he he likes a bit of the old sexual humor does he now does he he does, and he like, and he thought he found that just hilarious. <laughs> uh, now he finds the voice. Now I agree, I agree with him. He finds the voiceover from Newman confusing because I was saying that Newman speaks throughout it, but he sounds as if he's telling somebody in the future the story of what happened. But he, he dies at the end of the movie, so it's it's a bit confusing, isn't it? But overall, he sort of seemed to have. He, I think he sort of is is more in line with you, isn't he? Isn't he really on that? Where he sort of enjoyed bits of it, but found it to be. It slowed down a lot for him as it as it went on. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. But um, good to hear from you, Gore Blimey. Thanks, thanks as ever for your tireless input into our feedback section. Thank you very much, Gore Blimey, and not Gore Boy. Uh, we got some tweets now from Stevie Griffiths, who I you know, very unfortunately left out last time. I completely forgot to put his comments in. Then he was talking about uh, the Prowler. Uh, which is one of the films, of course, we covered on the last episode, I believe. He says here, Stevie Griffiths is at Stevie Man Muppet. Oh, let me just say uh, very quickly, going back to Gore Blimey for a minute, you can find him on Twitter at Double Agent 73. Uh, so, yeah, Stevie Griffiths at Stevie Man Muppet. He says, I really enjoyed The Prowler, some unusually vicious effect scenes, some great tension at points, and I liked how it had time to breathe rather than looking to shock every two seconds. Quality beats quantity kind of agree with that uh, also of note was the quirky side characters the cheesy 19, 1945 mc was a hoot the lazy trucker hat guy took the piss like a champ and miss allison was a delight during her short screen time i also like the acknowledgement of dead bodies at the end that slashes always ignore good touch anyway keep up the good work guys and i look forward to each show you deserve praise of showing such spirit so often after watching a high ratio of cack over classics. And I know there is more cack to come. So keep your spirits up and I will enjoy your take on things. Bye till next time, SG. So that's from uh, Stevie Griffiths at Stevie Man Muppet. Thanks a lot, Stevie. I think he's written in uh, a few times before. Mm -hmm. And uh, always nice to hear from him. And uh, he actually did the thing that most people don't do, which is tweeting f tweeting feedback to us. Yes. And uh, I responded to that by forgetting to put his tweets in the last show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so blame that on me. But uh, very nice to hear from you, Stevie. And uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. I'm guessing that's the first time he'd seen the movie. Yeah. And The Prowler, definitely a, a bit of a favourite of mine. Um, yeah. So, Tom, we've got an email from uh, somebody who's been listening to us for a while, who's a, a sort of new support... Uh, sorry, somebody who's writing in uh, more fairly recently. And... Uh, is somebody I've sort of been keeping track of listening to her, her show, Made for T Hit TV Mayhem, which I really enjoyed uh, very much. Her podcast. We'll, we'll give some details about that later. But why don't you read the email from her there? Okay. Amanda says, Hi, guys. This is Amanda again. I was able to squeeze in The Last Hunter over the weekend and wanted to drop you a line about it. I consider myself a pretty big Warbeck fan, but I'm most familiar with this Italian horror work. 
I have had The Last Hunter and Tiger Joe on VHS for some time, although I don't recall sitting through either one the whole way through. The only part I remember about Hunter is the scene with Warbeck running on the beach in those tiny swim trunks. I'm sure I giggled the first time because I know I giggled this time. She loves a bit of him. She loves a bit of Warbeck, doesn't she? I thought the film looked really good and I liked the score quite a bit. I have the end song on my iPod. And of course, Warbeck was charming as ever. But the film just didn't click for me. Ah, there you go. It's another yes, another one in your camp. Yes. Although there was a lot going on, it felt like nothing was happening. In fact, uh, the fact that they didn't reveal Warbeck's mission until close to the end and then threw in that woman, who I think we only saw once or twice as the twist, was, I don't know, just kind of an un- uninvolving experience. Yes, yes, my child. <laughs> Feel my power coursing through. <laughs> also, I didn't like that they dubbed over Warbeck's voice, which is perfectly beautiful, just like him. Why me? Oh. For whatever reason, he <laughs> often wasn't involved in the post dubbing on his films, and the voices never match him properly. Still, I was glad I finally saw the whole thing, and it was fun to watch along for the show. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it. I'm sure I'm in the minority, as it seems like a popular film. Well, maybe. Mm. Um, Not sure you will mention this in the trivia, but Antonio Margaretti was well known for using miniature sets for some of his action sequences. I'm pretty sure that portions of that scene at the beginning, after the soldier commits suicide and stuff starts blowing up, are filmed that way. Don't quote me, but I said it, and I'm sticking to my guns. I'm going to quote you. I also took a look at the Section 3 list over the last weekend and saw that Alice Sweet Alice is there. I'm actually catching it on the big screen this week. Ah, nice. It's so good, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it when you get round to it. There's a lot of interesting movies on the list, actually, so I feel I should ask, or maybe just need to revisit your first episode. But when it's a Section 3 movie, does that mean that it has to be cut somewhere to be made available for home video? And if so, what on God's green earth could they cut from Prom Night? That movie has, like, little in the way of gore. Maybe lose decapitation. Well, uh, we're sort of going back to the day now, uh, the Video Nasties era. I mean, Section 3 means nothing in this day and age, Amanda. It's kind of, I would imagine, nothing on the list we've seen so far would have any problem getting released uncut in the UK now. Um uh, I might be wrong, but probably. So I think what happened was uh, they were released either in uncut versions and went on the list or perhaps cut versions, you know, not to get on the nasties list or whatever. But the Section 3 list was sort of the lesser of the two evils that, you know, that they saw. So no one got anything, um, you know, no one went to jail for them. But yeah. It uh, so yeah, I, I think a lot of them probably came out and maybe then went away because of the whole video nasty thing. So maybe they didn't get released uh, until a few years later, something like that. I don't know. I'm no expert on that kind of thing. Uh, and she says, and thank you, Chris, for listening to my podcast. Well, I actually listened to it too, Amanda. Um, <laughs> and I think it's very good. Um, she done a Wes Craven episode there, didn't she? And You piss off, I liked it first. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another couple of episodes that I listened to. But you see, she's talking about made-for-TV movies, isn't she? And yeah. I think the movie of the week was a, a thing in America when... They had a lot less channels, so it was kind of like, oh, let's watch the movie of the, me- the week, you know, that are kind of made for TV movie. And a lot of them haven't really came over this side of the pond, I think. Um, but I think the mark of a good podcast is when you kind of still enjoy listening when you haven't really seen the movie. And yeah, she talks about her and her, her friends on the podcast talk about a couple of films that I haven't seen, but... I still really enjoyed it. You know, they've got a good rapport going on. They're funny. Um, so, yeah, it's a good show. What What did you think? Yeah, they're very much the same. I mean, you know, uh, I'm quite sort of jaded on the horror podcast thing anyway. You know, mm. it's not something I listen to very... It, not because I've got a huge ego or because I don't like listening to other horror shows. It's just not... I sort of like to learn about things I don't really know. So, you know, for example, it, 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 listening to a show like Made for TV, you know, Amanda will say something on there like... Uh, 
Oh, and of course, this movie was, of course, directed by this person. I'm like, I've got no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> but that in itself is, is then, you know, I'm then learning something I didn't know about. And I think made for TV movies is such a sort of a unique concept, really, isn't it? Mm. Sort of the idea of covering those. Don't know of many people who would do that. And, uh, yeah, they've got good chemistry on there and everything. And, um, you know, I just sort of enjoy I like learning things about, you know, subjects I don't really know that much about. And, uh and so it, it, it's a good listen. You can go check it out. Made for TV uh, Mayhem yeah. is the uh, podcast. And she's also got a website there. And it's just, you know, fun stuff. And she's a good supporter of us. So, uh, so yeah, good stuff. Good listen. And I listened to it first. Not Tom. <laughs> I, was the first, I was the first one to it. When did you listen to it out of interest? Oh, um, the day after we recorded our last episode. All right. You listened to it first. <laughs> what time? Uh, anyway, that was enough for me. But, <laughs> but that... But that you also had very kind, uh, kind words to say really made my day. You guys sound so professional and have such a great rapport. And I feel that my show still has a long way to go. So it was a nice compliment and greatly appreciated. Again, this was way too long. Take care, Amanda. Amanda, it was only long because we've talked all the way through it. So don't worry about yeah. it. Thanks for yeah, your email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah to, sorry about that, Amanda. We do seem to have a habit of just picking up on points within the email. We're so tedious to listen to, Tom. Why does anyone do it? I know, especially me. I'm, I'm super boring, but anyway... Why are you always mumbling, boy? That's uh, what I don't understand. The more you mumble, the less time I've got for my ego to get in the way. <laughs> Jesus, Tom, what's wrong with you? Uh, but no, thank you very much, Amanda. And um, it's funny, she I think she's probably got a bigger... She's got more Twitter followers than we have. So, um, mm. you know, she's probably more popular than we are. So I should say the, the honour is ours, really. Uh, right, we've got an email from Seth McKevlin. He's finally come back, Tom. Oh, it's been a while. He says, hey, guys, I'm really happy that Strange and Deadly is getting back on track. And we have. We've been back on track for a while now, I would say. Uh, now, I need to get myself back in the habit of tracking down some of the more obscure titles you'll cover that I don't already have. I haven't written in some time since I didn't have many of the movies you covered or I couldn't get my feedback in on time. I haven't seen Aftermath, so this is only in reference to The Last Hunter, which I had never bothered to watch until I saw you were covering it on the show. I expected it to be a Chuck Norris affair where one guy takes out the entire Viet Cong army, but this was surprisingly realistic and really showed the horrors of war. I just had to roll my eyes at the typical portrayal of Vietnamese women in the bar at the beginning, but after the suicide that takes place there, I knew this was going to be much darker than I had anticipated. I liked the device of the radio announcer urging the troops to leave. I've never seen that used before, but perhaps I haven't seen enough Vietnam War pictures. When it comes to Italian cash-ins, you never know how many of their ideas are original. I think the only campy things in this film were the fact that disco music plays over a battle scene, there were gratuitous close-ups of gore, and their cave hideout was wired for electricity and ventilation. Okay, I'll grant you that there may have been some pretty nice cave hideouts back then, but how many had slots and pinball machines? Other than that, I'm guessing it wasn't too far off. I'm including some scans of a book for you. The book is called Search and Destroy, an illustrated guide to Vietnam War movies. Like most of you, I buy books on genre films when I run across them. This one has a whole chapter on The Last Hunter, believe it or not. Yes, thanks very much, Seth, for uh, sending in the scans of that. I will definitely, you know, have a proper look at that. Um, I unfortunately didn't have time to look at it uh, before we, we were a bit rushed for this show. But um, so I sort of tried to bring my notes together for, from other sources. But I will definitely be reading that. And I thank you very much for, for sending it to me. Um, your next episode should be a fun one. I just watched the trailer for The Mad Foxes and it looks insane. I really don't think you've done a movie this episode since Firecracker. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Uh, really looking forward to that. Keep up the great work, Seth. Thank you very much, Seth. It's always nice to hear from, from people. Uh, you know, I've just heard actually on from on Twitter from Mr. Chris Brown, mm. uh, basically saying that he's been you know quite busy working and stuff like that, but he's catching up with the show and uh, and and you know getting started on his own podcast again, starting that back up. So hopefully we'll hear from him in, in the future. It's nice when we hear from you know people that we uh, you know we love to get to get feedback from. So yeah, yeah, good to hear from you again, Seth. Yeah, thanks a lot, Seth. Uh, Tom, we have a piece of audio now from an old friend. Yes. He's um he's going to be ramping up his uh, Christmas podcast, and it's always a bit special from Jim around mm. Christmas. He's um, you know, sometimes things become part of your Christmas watching on TV, but his Hypnagoria podcast always becomes a bit of a Christmas thing. So um, mm. yeah, yeah, I always watch Deep Throat at Christmas. Mm. Me too, me too, mm. and uh, Jim. I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> Jim <laughs> always does some good hypnagoria at Christmas as well. So let's listen to his feedback. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. Well, I think this might be one of the 
oddest double bills you've presented us with so far, but none the worse for it, I think. I must admit I'd not heard of The Last Hunter before, and only dimly heard vague rumours about the aftermath. So then, on to our Italian effort first. Apparently, Antonio Margheriti wanted to make a fun Vietnam film. What a strange concept for an unofficial sequel to The Deer Hunter. I don't think he really succeeded, but I don't think that's a bad thing, as fun and Vietnam aren't two words you'd normally put together. However, what we did get was a movie that took a rather different tack to your normal Nam film. It takes us red from the start that war is hell and doesn't really belabour the point and just gets on with telling us a story, and one that shows a side of the conflict we don't normally see. Interestingly enough, I've only recently just been reading about the concerted propaganda efforts of the Viet Cong, very much like what we saw in the movie. So it was rather fun to see this played out on the screen, and, as the movie goes on, become a central part of the plot. The Last Hunter is no classic, but at least we didn't have to go to a fucking wedding like we did in the original Deer Hunter. Margaretti, although he's not one of the stellar Italian exploitation directors, he proves yet again that he can put together a solid film with good pace, that looks good on a limited budget, and has a story that just clips along nicely. So then, on to the aftermath. Now, when I heard that this was an early 80s post-apocalypse movie, I was expecting some kind of cut-price Mad Max movie. A mid-price Max, if you will. So then, I was quite intrigued to see a movie that isn't just the usual leather-clad barbarians scooting around in dune buggies with far too many spikes to pass health and safety regulations. Now, on the downside, the acting was mainly atrocious, the script largely composed of clichés, and the ending did get a wee bit silly. However, despite that, I really enjoyed this movie, and I have a real soft spot for it now. For, although they didn't have the greatest thespians or bags of budget to play with, they produced a rather an interesting tale of an Earth devastated by global warfare. And the limitations of the production meant they actually ended up downplaying the whole scenario somewhat, which, in a strange kind of way, gave it more impact. It made it a human story and somehow felt a bit more realistic and gritty. And though they only had buttons and pocket lint to make the film with, the spacecraft looked pretty good, and the scenes of the devastated cities were actually jolly impressive. It was also nice to see Forry Ackerman and effects man Jim Danforth doing cameos, and I thought it was interesting the way that they mixed light and shade in this movie. Yes, it's a very nihilistic vision of the world, but there were moments of warmth and brightness in there. I also liked that the bad guys weren't actually the disfigured mutants, but rather an ordinary rough bunch of thugs exploiting the situation. And obviously, needless to say, you can't go wrong with having the leader as the great Sid Haig. So yes, uh, a cautious thumbs up for Last Hunter, and two very thumbs up for The Aftermath. Two films I'd not seen, and I thank you for bringing to my attention. Keep up the great work, lads. Thanks for that, Jim. I uh, I always enjoy Jim's input. He's, it's like a little mini podcast within a podcast. And uh, he says about uh, Margaretti wanting to make a fun Vietnam movie and not quite accomplishing that, but, uh, you know, takes a different path from a, a Deer Hunter ripoff. To be honest, mate, I, I've only watched the Deer Hunter once and I'm kind of with you. It, mm-hmm. It's a bit slow, isn't it? Mm. Um yeah, there's a whole scene at the wedding. Yeah. Is you could have cut that out and lost nothing in my. You know, I'm not a filmmaker, so you know, mm. I don't want to. You know, for people to enjoy it, but yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit slow that one. But it does go in a different direction. The yeah. uh, the last hunter, you can definitely say that. And uh, he, then he talks about aftermath, and he he says uh, about it being quite surprised, and it didn't follow like a Mad Max ripoff. To be honest, Newman. He doesn't really get mad in the same way that Max does, does he? His his mad is more calm and slightly bored. Yes, I would say that, but with a very good moustache and uh, a good chest. Good, good chest on him. Good chest. 
good hairy chest. And it, but, but Jim is very right. You know, a lot of the Italian movies, you know, the new Barbarians and oh, uh, or, or the new, you know, the new Gladiators. I can't remember which one it's called, but uh, twenty. I think it was what was it? Twenty nineteen after the fall of New York. Films like that, very much either aping Escape from New York or Mad Max, and this mm. one doesn't. So you've got to hand it to you know old uh, blanket. Uh, Barquet, whatever his name is. <laughs> Blank, is, it, is it Barquet or Blanket? I can't Barquet, yeah. <laughs> but um, Jim seemed to enjoy Aftermath quite a lot, which is good, you know. And, uh, you know, if someone's checked out a film that they're going to hopefully enjoy again from us doing this, then that's great, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, and he liked that the bad guys were really just thugs, not the mutants, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, enjoyed Sid Haig too. So, a cautious thumbs up for The Last Hunter and two thumbs up for Aftermath. Two thumbs on the same hand because he's mutated. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you seem to know a lot of information about Jim Moon that the rest of us don't know, Tom. I'm concerned about you. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, really, really great comment. Really great to hear from you. Always a, a pleasure for me and an honour. And um, yeah, I'm glad you sort of found something to like in Aftermath. You know, really seem to enjoy it, possibly even more than we did. So. Mm. You know, that's great. Uh, we now got an email from, oh, Tom. Let's say hello to Rob Maloha. Oh, I can hear the wind blowing me grass skirt up as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> is that the, is that your current attire? You've got a grass skirt on? Of course. Now, let me ask you this. Have you gone underpants on or are you free to the wind? Well, it is a war episode, so I have gone commando. Oh, brilliant, because that's the way I like you uh, best. This is an email from Rob Maloha, um, at Rob's Lib. I've put the wrong Twitter thing in there, but I've corrected it thanks to memory. Uh, email from Rob Maloha. He says, hello, ha, Chris and Tom, or aloha, Chris and Tom. After listening to your last entertaining episode, us entertaining, <laughs> didn't think we were. I feel better about not managing to send feedback as my views on the films pretty much matched yours. I'd not seen either before, but The Prowler certainly came on top with some fabulous kills and a gloomy atmosphere, particularly the gruesome discovery in the shower at the end. I thought that the killer was fairly obvious in both films, though. The wide-eyed younger brother in the flashback at the beginning of Prom Night was bound to become unhinged, while The Prowler's I'm going on a fishing trip is one of the oldest excuses in the book. I've been guilty of using it myself in the past, but obviously not for such nefarious schemes. Mm. My girlfriend's gone on a fishing trip now and again. Should I be (laughs) concerned about that? No, no, don't worry about that, mate. I'm sure it's. Uh, God, I'm sure it's all never, above board. Wish I'd never started reading this. I'm going fishing uh, actually in a couple of days' time. Oh dear, I don't trust you, Tom. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of bodies left in your wake. Uh, but it's been nice to move away from horror this time. And although I've never been a big fan of war films, both have been a pleasant surprise. The Last Hunter felt like a cannibal film. That's what I'm saying. With the man-eating natives being replaced by Viet Cong. The trashy Italian sensibilities, and I mean that as a compliment, added an air of cheesiness that made the atrocities of war a little more entertaining. It also has a great cast with David Warbeck and T. Safaro, and I particularly enjoyed seeing Bobby Rhodes outside of Demons. When it comes to cashing in on American films, the Italians have big Stugots, <laughs> also known as the Hunter of the Apocalypse. We don't really know what Stugots means, Rob. You'll have to let us know. Yeah. Uh, also known as Hunter of the Apocalypse, they were doing their best to milk the apocalypse now and deer, hunt, deer hunter Vietnam cash cows, Stugots. Uh, they even tried to release it as a sequel to the deer hunter known in Italy as Il uh, Cassiatore. By originally calling it Cassiatori 2. Um, I should just say, by the way, I never put this in the trivia because I forgot, but a lot of the locations in this were the same ones that we used in in The Last Hunter, were the same ones that we use in Apocalypse Now. Oh, wow. I'm a bit concerned that Aftermath is going to be another Cliff Tremlow moment because despite its many shortcomings, I absolutely loved it. You were wrong, Rob. You can see that Steve Barkett poured his heart, heart and soul and Stugots into the film. And maybe he can't really act. Maybe he can't really act right or direct that well, but I found the result endearing. For only 250000 the film had a polished and professional finish and the model's stunts, Stugots and special effects were brilliant. I mean, within the first 10 minutes, you've got heads exploding left, right and centre. And to top it, off, top it all off, <laughs> and to top it all off, it stars the great Sid Haig too. The score had an epic feel to it as well, even though some of it seemed quite out of place 
with the Stugots. <laughs> Aftermath sort of felt like a kid's film with added gore and nudity. It wouldn't take much editing to turn it into a Sunday afternoon morality adventure film for all the family, but then again, you'd lose all the good stuff. I have to say, I really enjoy both of these films and would love to see some decent UK releases. Hint, hint, Arrow, 88 films. Uh, keep up the good work, gents. Cheers, <laughs> Rob at Rob's Lib. So there we are. Good. If you're wondering why we kept saying Stugots, is because... Uh, Rob has a line in here which we think his uh, spell correction it might have been corrected to something uh, to a word that doesn't exist because <laughs> he's got here when it comes to cashing in on American films the Italians have big stugots we don't know what a stugot is but we found it hilarious is it Italian for balls or something it could be you know, <laughs> that's maybe what he meant Italians have big songs perhaps that's what he meant uh-huh. Or a big sausage or something like that. So uh, that is that from Mr. Rob Lips. Thank you very much for writing in. We always love when you do do so. And he always does research and uh, gives us little tidbits, pieces of information, which is great. Uh, so thank you very much again, Rob. Maloha uh, It's at Rob Slip. And that is the final piece of feedback. And that is going to be the end of our show. Uh, we hope we haven't been too boring, guys. Uh, mm-hmm. We're trying our best over here. And I hope you can understand me. Because I mumble too much. Why do you mumble so much, Tom? I don't know. Yeah, no. I really don't understand why you do. And me, I hope you can get past my huge, gigantic ego and the tedium that exists every time you listen to us in order to enjoy, hopefully, what might be an entertaining time. Uh, So, Tom, if people want to get in touch with you, why would they want to? But if they want to, why would they want to get in touch with both of us? But if they want to get in touch with you, how could they do it? Uh, I'm Grand House Tom on Twitter, and uh, our Stranger Deadly Twitter feed is at Strange Deadly. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can uh, find me on Twitter. It's twitter.com forward slash the Gore Boy. <laughs> the Gore Boy. What a silly name. Why did I? <laughs> why did I? Why did I pick it? Uh, God, how foolish of me. Uh, and you can also find me on Instagram at the Chris Clayton. Now, Tom, once again, we have a very different set of films for the uh, next episode episode 20 it's going to be um we're not going back to horror this time what have we got in store for the folks on the next episode this is going to be quite interesting because it's it's one of those you know when we looked down that list we kind of there was some we knew fitted together like the hills of ice texas chainsaw massacre is a bit of a no-brainer then there are films that we looked at and thought well that kind of looks like it might go with that so this is one of those times we have A couple of films that appear to be, because neither of us have seen them, so we don't know, but uh, gang stroke rape revenge movies. Mm -hmm. There's one called The Mad Foxes and another called Street Killers, which is also known as Mad Dog Killer. So you can kind of see why we've put these two together. But yeah, you know, it's going to be another interesting little avenue off the Section 3 list. Yeah, there's quite a lot of diverse films, really. A diverse mm. selection of films on this list, and uh, yeah, taken again to a sort of territory that I don't, I don't know if either of us are, are too familiar with this kind of thing, really. No, you know, I I do like a good re- revenge film. You know, I, I tend to not go for the rapier kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. um, I'm really not sure what to expect from these ones. So it, it really is going to be quite interesting. Yeah, so you can look forward to that. Uh, if you don't mind us tediously ploughing through two more films on this Section 3 list. Mm. Uh, well, you can look forward to that on the next episode, episode 20 of The Strange and Deadly Show. Probably be with you in another fortnight. So until then, I've been Stu Gott. And, <laughs> and I've been Tom the Mumbler Elliot. Yes, and I'm not really Stu Gott. I'm Chris the Egotist Clayton. Bye for now. Bye.
so yeah, Tom, you, you, you're right. They really don't show up that much, do they, uh, at all through the whole thing? Really, the 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 major villain here, of course, is, is Cutter and his gang. Now, Cutter, played by uh, our friend, um, our fucker's name. What's his name? <laughs> Sid Hank. <laughs> oh, no. Just I'll cut it. Oh no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our old friend Sid Haig. <laughs> When it comes to cashing in on, on, when it comes to cashing in on American films, the Italians have big. What, what is that? Uh, have big stugots. What does that stugots. mean? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been budgets. Um, yeah, big. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something must have spell corrected on his um... studios. <laughs> studio. Big when stunts? it comes to cashing in on American films, the Italians have big. It can't be budgets because <laughs> they haven't. Or, or studios. Could it be stunts? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I will read it in the show as Stu <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then we'll let we'll leave it for uh, <laughs> we'll leave it for Rob to tell us what he meant. 